like to call to order the August 6, 2013 meeting of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. And as always, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, if you'll join me in prayer. God, thank you for a wonderful summer season. We're so blessed with moderate four-season weather here and often fail to appreciate the balance you've given to nature to provide us with flowers, plants, trees, food that provide for all your creatures. As school begins to prepare and get initiated for another year, bless all the students, teachers, administrative staff, principals, and all the parents who care for our future and care for our children the opportunities they have in education. Thank you for these men and women who sit up here as commissioners. Our community is so fortunate to have a group like this that all care for the county and work hard to make sure we try to enact the best laws we can that help citizens and businesses thrive and spread prosperity to as many people as we can. Give us wisdom and discernment tonight as we take up many issues and proposals that impact many lives, lifestyles, and other decisions. Thank you for the amazing time, place, and chance we have to make a difference and improve our county the best we can. Amen. Amen. In accordance with the Code of Ethics adopted by the Commission, it's the duty of every commissioner to avoid both uh, conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict. Does any commissioner know of any known conflict or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before our board today? No. If not, we will proceed on to public comment. The time limit for any public comment is three minutes. If your time expires, you may leave any questions with your name, address, phone number, or email with the county manager, and we'll get back with you. Commissioners are not expected to comment on matters during public comment. The comments should be limited to subjects that are within our jurisdiction or pertain to matters upon which we may act. Any individual speaking during public comment shall address the entire commission. Any polling of commissioners is inappropriate. Persons addressing the commission are expected to observe the decorum of the chamber and to be respectful for everyone in the room. Any person who willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts the session will be asked to leave the meeting. And the Commission deserves the right to deny any public address on any subject previously presented to the Commission. Uh, if you will give your name and where you live, we'll start public comment. Who would like to have uh, part of public comment tonight? Yes, ma'am. Second row. If you'll go over here. Sorry. My name is Amanda Hall. I live at 156 Black Oak Drive. Uh, my comments are very short tonight. Um, I would like to, as, on behalf of all the residents up there, thank uh, Wanda Green, Matt Stone, Jerry V. Hahn, Kurt Euler. We're the, we're the house is sliding. Um, and really thank all the county personnel. Who's, we're a small community, but I know we've been a large volume of phone calls and emails, and everybody has been very responsive, and I know we're moving forward. and. We just wanted to uh, thank the county staff very much. Thank you so much. We are sorry about the actions and everything that's going on there. Any other public comment? And I would remind everybody, uh, if people are here on the, any of the, the ETJ or the Charlotte Highway rezoning request, we're going to have a public hearing on that. So while you're welcome to get up now, it might be more appropriate to talk during the public hearing because that's when we're going to be focused in on that one. So any other public comment tonight? Mr. Rice? Um, it, uh, go ahead, uh, ma'am, on the third row. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Hall? Lisa. Lisa. Okay, Lisa Baldwin. Come in. Uh, Ms. Baldwin is a member of the Buncombe County uh, Board of Education. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I live in Fairview. My name's Lisa Baldwin. I'm here because you're voting to approve the purchase price for uh, Inca Intermediate School uh, property. Um, 
I sympathize with the overcrowding at the Inca Middle School, but I have many concerns and unanswered questions regarding the build of another, yet another intermediate school. School boards are to vet decisions and ensure that the optimal solution is reached. Our board has not done this regarding the situation at Inca Middle School. There's been no parent interest survey. There's been no public hearing. This is a top-down decision made by the Buncombe County School Central Office administrators, which they expect to be rubber stamped by a board majority. We've seen no data showing that intermediate schools are the best approach uh, to education. Um, we also have seen no financial data concerning the operating costs of this school. Just because we have $22 million sitting in a bank account that's earmarked for construction of schools and debt repayment does not mean we have to spend it. In fact, a bill was proposed in this last legislative session to make that Article 39 sales tax revenue more flexible so it could be spent uh, on digital learning, teacher professional development, other things like that. And I'd, I'd love to see this board support um, that bill uh, going into the next session. It did not uh, make it uh, for passage in this past session. But as you know, uh, bricks and mortar um, is not as important as teaching and learning and focusing dollars on the classroom. So the bottom line is that there are too many unanswered questions to approve the purchase of land for an Inca intermediate. Um, I would like to encourage this board to ask for a professional capacity study to be conducted for all Buncombe County schools before proceeding to approve the Inca intermediate uh, site. Ask the Buncombe County Board of Education to look at other options that are less expensive but will achieve a win-win situation. Back in 2008, it seems what was needed in the Robertson District was not an intermediate school but an elementary school. There are only three elementary schools there, while other similar sized Buncombe County feeder districts have four to five elementary schools. So when Kuntz was built, um, it could now be uh, changed to a 4-5 school or an elementary school to accommodate students in the Inca district. Only a small number of Inca students could be redrawn into the Robertson district. Um, the Robertson district would then have surplus capacity in all their schools most likely uh, if Kuntz became a 4-5 school or an elementary school. Uh, this is not going to cost $22 million okay, to build. Ms. Baldwin. Thank you and thank you for your service on the board. Any other public comment? Yes, ma'am, Michelle Pace Woods. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Michelle Pace Wood. I do have a daughter in the Inca School District. Thank you so much for listening and, and for taking this up today. This is a really important issue. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation about the Inca Middle School. Uh, a lot of folks are, are saying things like it's a bureaucratic process, for instance, or that it's not something that the parents have had input on. This, this school board actually voted, and if you go back through the record in the, in the least, or the and the solution that they voted on back in 07, this school should have been, been built last year, and it was not started. Um, I understand there were some problems, um, financial problems, and things changed, other things came up. But they already voted on this, and they already got a parent survey because they surveyed all three school districts when that happened. So we have been patiently waiting um, for this school to be built. Um, we understand in that district that fiscal responsibility is important. We now are in a situation where we have three other elementary schools that are starting to become overcrowded, one of which will be at crisis level per the last uh, school board fiscal um, report they did in two years. Um, Inca Middle has always been um, very, very overcrowded. It's been the high schools in the 50s, and then it was changed. They added on. And if you look at the data, it is the most overcrowded middle school west of Charlotte. And there's a reason that those are not at that capacity. It's too easy for kids to become anonymous at Inca Middle. Uh, Inca High has a low graduation rate. I know you guys look for that and work for that. If you're anonymous in middle school, you're not engaged when you go to high school. 
We feel like it's really important. If you build this school, when you do, and I hope you'll vote to, to go ahead and buy this land, you're going to solve four school crowding problems with one build. It is the fiscally responsible decision to do. Um, you know, we, we know that the parents out there have supported it. We've all been waiting patiently. We appreciate you finally taking a look at this. We would appreciate you voting for the land tonight. Um, if you wait, it would have been 18.2 million if you'd done it when you first did it. Now it's 22. The longer you wait, the more expensive. This bill is coming. It is coming, no matter what. And let's go ahead and, and pay it now when it's cheaper for all the schools and cheaper to buy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wood. You know the public comment tonight. Yes, sir, in the back. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my name is John Sutton. I'm also a Candler resident um, and a parent of two children that are in Hominy Valley Elementary School. Um, I'm here tonight to, I guess, speak on behalf of um, the parents and business owners in Candler, we support this school being built. Um, the studies have been done. We've been waiting for the school. I want to thank the commissioners that have worked hard and the school board to get this school, this project back on the agenda and back moving forward. We don't want to see a, a step backwards. Um, I just want to thank you for your vote yes tonight and keep this project moving forward. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Sutton. Any of the public comment? Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, on the intermediate school, I've lived in Inc. all my life, and we welcome uh, something, uh, not necessarily this particular school. Uh, or this particular site. This particular site I want to speak to because Miss Baldwin has been beat up over the years uh, for talking about environmental issues. Well, you're looking at a man that can read you several thousand pages of environmental issues related to the BASF property. And this particular piece of property for the school district has got the uh, Hominy Creek running through it and it's one of the most contaminated creeks in Buncombe County, and it's going to stay that way for some time, and it runs around the property, and it goes through the bottom side of the property, so how accessible is the kids going to be to this creek and other contamination? Not only that, you're looking at aquatic center in the future of $30 million, and you're going to be putting things in there that is going to be contamination uh, uh, looking at contamination as well. People that's getting up here and asking for the school and talking about the school, listen, this is a commercial district. You know, it's hard to find commercial property, not commercial, but industrial property. Why don't we leave it as commercial and industrial and find a place for the school in a good location and not put our kids at risk, not only from the environmental point of view, and I've got data to support what I'm saying. Uh, you can get any study you want to to support, and we'll hear from the superintendent that they've drilled these little 40-foot holes and 50-foot holes. You'll hear all this, but it's going to say exactly what you want to hear. This thing has been done in reverse. It usually goes to the school board, and you hear all these things, and then it comes over here. Uh, I'm afraid it's not been to the extent of what we've been hearing tonight. But my concern is very much about the environmental issues. Uh, and it's not about this little study that's been done. So don't, whatever the superintendent had to say about that, don't, don't confuse that with what I've got to say. Because I've talked to the people in Raleigh and I've, I've already filed complaints, uh, not complaints, but in my public comment to the Brownfield site on this property. And let me tell you, the head chief in Raleigh said it was heavily contaminated at BASF. Now, that's on the basin. This basin runs at the lower end of this school property in a long stretch. So uh, we've got some more work to be done here. And uh, I'm happy to work on it with you. I'll sit down and talk to any one of you if you'd like to, because 
I don't think the data had been given to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rice. <clears throat> Is there any of the public? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Thank you, Commissioners. I am Emily Sutton Desio. I'm a, here to support the approval of the 5 6 school in Inca. Um, I'm a business owner and I live in Inca Village. Inca Village is directly across the street from the proposed site. I'm a member of the Inca Park Commission and I'm also a member of the Inca Candler Business Co op. And I can tell you in all of our meetings, um, we all support the funding of this school and we support the hard work you're doing, support the hard work of the school board. I'm a parent of a four year old and I hope she can attend this school. Um, you really can't focus on learning and teaching when there aren't enough chairs in the classroom. And the Inca 5-6 school is a fiscally responsible solution to a problem addressing three schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutt. Any other comments tonight? Seeing none, we'll go to our first public hearing, which is the rezoning request on the Rosenberger uh, Charlotte Highway from RLD to NS. And we'll have Debbie Trumphy to talk about the uh, background Mr. behind Excuse this. Excuse me, Mr. And Chairman. Did you mean to skip over the consent agenda items for approval? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I sure did. Is there a motion to adopt the... Thank you, Mr. Fr is there a motion to, to follow the agenda, including adoption of the consent agenda items with the exception of the resolution <laughs> on the uh, organic waste and the school capital fund project that will be pulled up and discussed in more detail. Second. It's been a motion by Commissioner Frost. There's a second by Vice Chair Jones to follow our uh, amended agenda as I have discussed. Is there any discussion among the commissioners? If not, all those in favor of following the agenda as revised say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion carries seven to zero. Now we're ready to go with the public hearing on the rezoning request, and we'll start with Debbie Trumphy to tell us a little bit about the background and what has happened up to this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, C. Daryl Rosenberger has applied to rezone a portion of tax lot pin 9677212223 which is approximately six acres from RLD, residential low density, to NS, neighborhood service district. The subject property is located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Charlotte Highway and Cedar Mountain Road and is currently wooded and undeveloped. The planning department is recommending denial of this application. The tract is steep with an average natural slope of over 42 percent and has both steep slope, high elevation, and protected ridge zoning overlays. The surrounding area is comprised of other large undeveloped tracts of land and residential development. The nearest commercially zoned property is approximately 2,000 feet away to the east and to the west of the property. This rezoning could be viewed as a spot zoning by the courts as it does not include several property owners nor a large amount of land in relation to the surrounding area. The proposed map amendment would not be consistent with the Buncombe County Comprehensive Land Use Plan as the 2006 update indicates that the RLD Low Density Residential District is primarily intended to provide locations for low density residential and related type development in areas where topographic or other constraints preclude intense urban development. RLD is the appropriate zoning classification for this property given the topography of the site. NS would not be appropriate as the portion that has been requested to be rezoned has a slope greater than 33 percent and contains steep slope high elevation overlay districts. The requested zoning would not be reasonable nor in the public interest as it would allow a commercial use to encroach into an area characterized by low density residential development. The planning board held a public hearing on this application on June 17th. Three people spoke during public comment and all were against the proposed rezoning. The speakers expressed concerns about traffic safety and volume noise and light pollution, stormwater runoff, 
and the loss of a critical wildlife corridor. The planning department has continued to receive communications about this application and they have all been against this rezoning. The planning board after deliberations did find that the proposed rezoning would be reasonable and in the public interest and would be consistent with the land use plan as NS is designed to allow for a mix of residential, commercial, business and service uses in limited areas at key intersections leading to residential neighborhoods. The planning board voted to recommend approval of this on a four to one vote. Um, there is a, a complicated zoning history for this piece of property that I'd like to, to tell you about. In 2007, when we were developing countywide zoning, uh, this property was proposed to be RLD. Uh, during that process, um, it was allowed for people to request a zoning other than what had been proposed for their property and the owner did request NS for the property. Uh, the planning staff looked at, at it and given the, the topography and surrounding area denied that request which was appealed to the planning board. The planning board at that hearing compromised basically and said the front along 74 can be NS, the middle part would be R3 residential and the back part, the steepest part, still remain RLD. So when 2007 countywide zoning was adopted, that parcel had three different zoning districts across it. Um, after the appeals co court nullified that 2007 um, zoning, uh, we were advised by our attorneys to review those zoning maps for anything that the courts would consider spot zoning. Um, and we did identify that as something that would be considered spot zoning. And when the 2009 zoning was adopted, that parcel was zoned as RLD. Right after that zoning was adopted in early 2010, the owner applied to rezone that parcel to NS again. The planning board at that point um, did recommend approving the rezoning, but the Board of Commissioners at their public hearing denied that application. Uh, later in that year, in two th October of 2010, we adopted the zoning overlays, and this parcel has both the steep slope high elevation and the protected ridge overlays on it. Uh, the part that is um, being requested for the rezoning um, does have uh, steep slope and high elevation overlays. And I'd be happy to address any questions you have for me right now. Any questions for Ms. Trumpy? This property, <clears throat> I've been watching it for quite a few years. Uh, but before zoning come into effect, it was for sale for business then zoning come in effect that it was put on then it was illegal but it was commercial then when we zoning went away then it came back then it came to this board again five of them with the planning board saying it could be commercial but then the five voted that it couldn't be commercial then the gentleman I, I sat and watched because I drive that way every day I watched him take his paintbrush and paint commercial off of it. Well, the facts that are forgotten in this whole issue is we've got uh, cedar cliffs down the mountain or whatever. I live in Winsong. But <clears throat> we have people that send us a bunch of emails and I appreciate every one of them. But I still look at the side of the, the property rights of the people that own the property. This man spent $100,000 to get sewer up to that point that tied in to, uh, what's the name of that break? Cedar Cliffs. The cliffs, the cliffs that, uh, are on Charlotte Highway there. So it runs from one side of the road up to that side of the road and this man spent $100,000 plus, we forget the man lost his property in the process because once this board took it from commercial down to housing, that took the value of the property away. So not only one sign I've seen up there, I've saw a sign where it went into foreclosure. 
Now, how it's all come back around, this is before I was commissioner, you just, you just watch properties and it's the top of the mountain. I've looked at the maps, it can be worked out. I live in a development that we had an option before zoning come in to buy some property uh, to tie to our subdivision. We didn't buy it, but we ended up with four apartments, with four apartments each in it. Plus in the flat area next to the stream, there is uh, firehouses. But what we did, we just put a fence up. So we had an option, but now we've given people the option to tell us what we need to do with our land. That's, that's the problem that this one commissioner, whatever the other commissioners think, we are telling people what they can do with their land. I see people that live on steep slopes that's already there that don't want a house on that slope over there on the other side because that tires their view shed up. I was totally against the zoning to start with. I, we have trailers next to the development in. It has not hurt my property value any, the development that I live in. We have, you pull out of our development, there's a little business on the left that sells tires. Good for them. That brings money into Fairview. When you're telling people that they can't put something, that's taking our tax revenue away. If somebody come in there and spend a million dollars, say on a nice condo, that it could be developed in that area. I mean, I sat and watched an area that was a whole mountain taken away down there at the foot where the, uh, they sell cemetery stones, but we've approved it for a hotel. And how they're going to get it in there, I don't know, because they've took half the mountain way, so they're going to have to build one of them high walls behind it. I don't want an 80-foot wall in Fairview again. I saw that. I don't see that happening here. But basically, the man's just wanting to try to make a living and sell his property. If there's something wrong with that, I have a problem. It's, it's a simple fact. There's too much in this issue. I understand a lot of people's against it. Uh, the only thing I'm against is we had an option in my development to buy a partial, and we didn't buy it, but it hasn't affected us in any way, shape, or form except we put a fence up. If the people don't want it, then the best thing I can say is they just need to buy it. We're giving people options, 20 people options to send emails to us to tell us what we need to do. I don't, I'm, I don't feel comfortable with it. And uh, that's, that's just, just the way I feel. There's more to this than the story says. All right, thank you, Mr. Fryer. Any other questions for Ms. Trumpy? If not, thank you, ma'am. We'll start our public hearing. We'll hear from any members of the public that like to be heard. We'll take a, we'll have a three-minute time limit. If you have any other information, you can leave it with us. We have heard from a lot of folks, and thank you for uh, talking to us about the, your concerns here. And now is your time to talk to us before we uh, uh, close the public hearing and take a vote. Uh, the time now, that we'll start the public hearing at 4.58. Any members of the public wish to be heard? Yes, sir. And uh, you, uh, I'll tell you what, let's, why don't you go next, you gentlemen in the fourth row. You'll go first, Mr. Um, in the tie, and we'll just have you sit on the front row if you could over here. Anybody, let, let's get the number of people that want to speak. Let's go, uh, you in the, you behind the post can't see you now. You take the first seat. Uh, sir, you in the cat, if you'll remove your hat, you'll get the second seat. And you on the other side, ma'am, with the white shirt, uh, we'll have you have the third seat next to Ms. Trumpy, and we'll take you in order, and then we'll, we'll go, we'll take another look at it after we get started. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We're going to get organized here. Hello. Give your I'm, name and where you live, sir. Hello. I'm Alan Helmick. I've lived in Fairview for 30 years this October. I've been a top-producing North Carolina realtor for 30 years, now with Keller Williams, specializing in Fairview. I've sold hundreds of homes, thousands of acres, most, most of which I've deed restricted. I've done everything I could to help and protect Fairview. Every property anyone sold on Highway 74A had commercial prices with commercial value. Department of Transportation took property to five lane Highway 74A in 2000 and assured everyone that they were leaving us with commercial potential and value. I'm here to plead my case because I feel there's been a real injustice done in, in zoning. I used to own this 10-acre tracks, and now I'm a partner with the new owner, Daryl Rosenberger. I had this property listed for sale as commercial in open-use zoning with engineered building plans. August 2004, I paid to run the sewer to this property 
at a cost of $200,000 and received a 97,500 gallon sewer allotment from Buncombe County. Later, Southcliff tied onto it and helped me with the cost. In 2007, when Buncombe County zoned the Metropolitan Sewage District, which I'm now in, Southcliff was granted 20 acres commercial. My 10 acres was zoned residential low density. I appealed to have six acres of the 10 acres zoned neighborhood services, knowing I would never get commercial. The planning board and the commissioners approved neighborhood services on this property. But then the zoning was kicked out. In 2010, when, or nine, when zoning, when Buncombe County had again zoned the Metropolitan Sewage District, my 10 acres was again zoned residential low density. I appealed again, <coughs> and the planning board approved neighborhood services. The commissioners did not. This is a prime six acre track lo located on a corner intersection. It has public water, sewer, gas, electric, cable, etc., with DOT curb access onto Highway 74A. This property has 700 foot of road frontage on a five lane Highway 74A, 600 foot frontage on state maintained Cedar Mountain Road, and rear access on Atherton. This property is bordered by a cell tower and a large city water reservoir tank with right away on Atherton through this property. I don't feel like this is spot zoning. This property is separated from the other commercial because of topography. Every property around this up and down the highway is steep, either straight uphill or straight downhill, which would also prevent the spreading of commercial development in the future. This corner property at a main intersection is terraced in three plateaus and is perfect location for small neighborhood services. It has large neighborhoods all around it, the zoning all around it. This zoning change will not only increase the tax revenue for the county, it will benefit the community. Again, for the third time, the planning board has approved neighborhood service for the six up, acre sir. track. I hope the commissioners agree. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm David Holt. I live out in Fairview. And uh, my concern about this is the fact that you're creating a traffic hazard there. I would invite all of you to go drive up Mine Hole Gap, come over the top, turn around and come back and just see what a blind hill that is coming down. We live on Cedar Mountain Road, so when you come out of Cedar Mountain Road, I invite you to turn in there and then try to turn left out of there. C putting a development in there like you're talking about, or he's talking about, uh, with commercial and uh, residential is gonna create a great deal of traffic right there. It's a very dangerous place. Our daughter was killed on Highway 74 uh, right out uh, in, in another curve, and since that curve has been rectified by the state, they cleared that up. It, you're going to have to clear this one up too if you make this, if you vote this in, because there's going to be accidents there. There was a, a young woman killed, a young girl killed, and her mother seriously injured uh, just 100 yards from where we're talking about this development being just three months ago. You need to drive out there and look at it. It's not a safe place for a commercial development. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Holt. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name's Jeremy Jones. I live on Cedar Mountain Road. And this has got more to do with putting up fences, just like the gentleman mentioned. It is a hazard. You're looking down a double barrel shotgun when you turn left out of Cedar Mountain. And that's just before the crest of the hill. We've got uh, runoff from that disaster that was created up the road of the Chestnut Mountain that still has not been, it's still falling today. There's, uh, it's a scenic highway. I, all this stuff was brought up three years ago and there hadn't been nothing changed. We're not planting any more trees, so we've still got the, the last bit of the woods before the Swannanoa Valley. So I, I'm here today to say I oppose this and would like to see it not ever be brought up again. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Jones. Uh, who else wants to be heard on this? Uh, let me get uh, the lady in the purple uh, and the three people, just you three together, y'all come on up. We'll do you in order. Uh, and gentlemen, okay, you three first, and then we'll hear from, um, I'll tell you what, you go ahead, you're, you're close, you go ahead, and you three, you three have a seat. We'll do it that way. <laughs> Just come on up. <laughs> uh, my name is Frank Wartman. I live on Butler Mountain, uh, which is the mountain that is serviced by Cedar Mountain Road. Um, we have uh, three subdivisions up there. Uh, there are representatives here, I think, from all three of the subdivisions. We're representing about 80 different lots and about 60 different people. Um, 
the, all of the reasons that the um, staff from planning and zoning gave are accurate. We shouldn't be even considering this. I'm, cons I'm confused by what PNZ board did because they didn't take into account anything that they said. It's a dangerous intersection. It's going to cause water runoff across a road where the guy who lives there at the, where the downhill comes in to Cedar Mountain Road, he just had to fix his driveway because of the drainage problem. And it's not, they haven't paved that hill yet. Um, I would urge you, and I've got some photographs with me, if you're not sure about the slope of this land, first of all, take a look at the map that your staff gave you. Because if you look at the little topographical lines, you'll see how steep this is. But photos from the air will also show you how steep it is. It's going to be ugly because if you sit on the overpass at, at the uh, East Asheville Home Depot, you can see the cell tower and everything that's in front of it. So you're going to be able to see this from there. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Gina Donatelli Maselli, and I own land off with my, my husband off of Cedar Mountain Road, and we hope to build a house there someday and raise a family there. And nothing terrifies me more than the thought that this dangerous stretch of road could get even more dangerous for the family that we hope to raise there someday. Um, it's a, like they said, it's a blind curve. It's a very steep road. When it rains, the water just runs down it, kind of like a you know slide at a water park. And and cars just every time it rains, you expect to see someone run into the the rock wall because it just it happens almost every single time. And the thought of um, additional entrances to business further complicating those traffic patterns is a nightmare. And um, I'm just here on behalf of myself and my family and friends that live in Fairview to um, urge you to please deny this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Donatelli. Yes, ma'am. Or yes, you all decide. Hi there. My name is Darren Stroop, and I live uh, on Cedar Mountain Road just around the bend from the... Uh, the main intersection that uh, has been spoken of, uh, which is not a main intersection, it's a side road that comes off a hill. Uh, my wife and I moved uh, there from Asheville in 2009, and we've been very happy to uh, live in this neighborhood in the mountains with the uh, mature forests and the wildlife, the clear uh, starry nights, and the quiet. Uh, rezoning this property at the crest of Minehole Gap as commercial would have a negative impact on all the things we find valuable in this neighborhood. Uh, the effects of rezoning would lead to an increase in noise pollution from the cutting down of trees, construction, increased traffic congestion, and possibly from whatever business is built on the parcel. We still have no idea what that's going to be. Uh, soil erosion and runoff from the site is inevitable and it would affect the health of Gashes Creek, which runs through the base of that property and uh, follows 74 to the Swannanoa River. Uh, soil erosion and the resulting runoff will also lead to increased costs in road maintenance and the property degradation for surrounding neighbors. We'd see the loss of mature forest and a critical wildlife corridor on a mountain that is not only located on an historic scenic byway, but that can be seen all the way from I-40. There would be an increase in light pollution in our neighborhood from any resulting development, and there would be an increase in traffic hazards and congestion at the end of our road. Uh, unfortunately, the planning board totally dismissed these and other concerns, as well as the clear analysis and recommendation of the planning department. There was no substantive discussion or debate about the merits or demerits of rezoning, and it seemed clear they were not familiar with the property or the surrounding area. In the end, what swayed them was uh, that the property owner had invested money in the property, and had I been able to speak again, uh, I would have pointed out to the uh, planners that my wife and I didn't get our house for free. Uh, we, in fact, made a 30-year investment, and our neighbors have made like investments. Uh, we, uh, my next question would have been, will uh, the owner and his partner still be there in 30 years, or even two years, or will they have made their money and moved on, leaving me and my wife and the rest of the neighborhood to deal with the fallout from this business deal and unsuitable development? So I ask you, commissioners, have some forethought in this matter. Uh, please follow the analysis and recommendation of the Department of Planning to deny rezoning. Please respect the residents' overwhelming stance against allowing a commercial development to encroach into our neighborhood. Please respect the surrounding natural environment that we live in and enjoy, and that so many others also enjoy as they pass through it every day. And please respect our safety, our quality of life, and the investments we've made in our properties in our neighborhood. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stroop. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Jamie K. Young. I'm an Asheville native. I was born and raised in Fairview. I only left Fairview for five years in order to go to college. I have a bachelor's in science with a minor <coughs> in geology. My main concern here is the environment. Um, I left school for five years. I only got to come home on the weekends, and every weekend I came home, there was something new being built, more dangers being produced by the developments. The highway has only gotten more dangerous. Whenever I was in sixth grade during my English class, I heard the sirens go off in order to blow up the mountain to make the five-lane highway. We all thought it was a blessing originally because it would take an hour to get to school because of the traffic being backed up. Whenever I was 13 years old, I was at a Halloween party and right as the road was being built, I was outside and one of my friends decided, I don't know why, decided to go over to the food line to get something to drink and come back, not alcohol, we were 13. On his way back, he didn't see a car coming and he got hit by a car on 74. I was 13 years old and had to watch one of my best friends get killed and roll over the top of a car and fall into a ditch. One of the last things I want to see happen to Fairview is too much further development. I don't mind if you pick a flat piece of land. I don't mind if it's on the road. What I do care about is the safety of our community. I plan on raising children here. I'm 26 years old. My parents brought us here and whenever I left for college I thought I was going to leave forever. And it's whenever I left that I truly gained an appreciation for Fairview. I had every opportunity to go to New York City and do internships with photographers. That's what I do. I was actually begged at one point, but I wanted Fairview. I wanted my slice of heaven. I'm about to own a house. My life savings are going to go into that. And I just, I couldn't, I really honestly can't deal with somebody getting hurt because of this happening. Cedar Mountain Road is one of the most terrifying roads to be not only on to drive from Emmons Grove Road to the end that connects to 74, but in order to pull out of Cedar Mountain on 74, it's almost like playing Russian roulette. You don't know if there's a car coming until you're out of the road. I do not like going down this road myself. Um, it will cause bad drainage, which is already existing. There are a few drainages as it is, and more, most of the time they're clogged. They never get clean. Actually, yesterday I saw somebody cleaning them up. That was the first time I've ever seen that. And just mainly, I, I want us to keep our community beautiful. And like I said, I don't mind if it's on the road, and I don't mind if it's on a flat piece of land. Just It doesn't need to be in a dangerous place. And I understand that he spent the money on the property, as have I, with my own. And he shouldn't be told what to do, but this is for the safety of him and whoever will, you know, reside. Thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you. Who else wants to be heard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Beard and uh, the lady next to Mr. Stroop. Anybody else? Another comment? Y'all come on up. You you'll start, sir. Okay. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I was here three years ago. Name where you live. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Steve Schmeiser. I live in Fairview. I'm here representing my wife and I who are Fairview residents. I'm also here representing the North Carolina Wildlife Federation as the past president of the local chapter called Mountain Wild. Um, as I was saying, I was here three years ago. Um, I was at the planning board meeting in June. And um, I, I share the views e expressed by uh, Mr. Stroop that um, the planning board meeting was a little bit strange um, and I didn't feel the issues were explored by the planning board. Um, I wanted to say that um, nothing has changed since uh, the zoning was denied three years ago. The current zoning is correct. It's a Scenic Ridge Line property. It has steep slopes. Stormwater runoffs really are a problem. Adjoining parcels are all residential. Rezoning would clear cut a minimum of six acres. That's close to six football fields. Think about that. A huge scar on the mountain at the top of the mountain, visible from the entire Asheville Basin. I came here three years ago, and I'm here again tonight on behalf of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation to say that this parcel is in the middle of a wildlife migration corridor 
This corridor was designated by the Land of Sky Regional Council, of which Buncombe County is a member, uh, during the Linking Lands and Communities study that I was a part of several years ago. Uh, we selected this as a critical wildlife migration corridor for two reasons. Uh, it is a, an existing wildlife migration corridor. Um, we felt it would be protected because of the zoning in the master plan. Uh, does only allow for low density development. We felt the tree canopy would remain. But the second major reason that we selected it is it is the only remaining wildlife corridor south of Asheville in Buncombe County that essentially goes east and west. So this parcel would, would cut half of that out. You may remember, um, Mr. Gant and, and Ms. Jones, that three years ago, the owners of the adjacent parcel, which I think is 18 to 20 acres, that's finishing the crest and down into Fairview, they were here and they were denied rezoning. They'll be back if you approve this one. And we'll have lost the entire uh, wildlife corridor. Um, I would close by saying, um, I did some research on this property. Mr. Rosenberger purchased it on March 22nd of this year. He knew how it was zoned. And um, he's a resident of Florida. Uh, he hasn't been at any of the hearings. Uh, I would invite him to move up and live on his parcel. We would welcome him as a taxpayer in our, in our community. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Smart. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, can you hear me? I'm Kendra Sarvati. I live at um, 35 Cedar Mountain Road with my husband, Darren. And um, I know that um, some of the folks that have already spoken have talked about how um, the traffic is a huge concern. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to reiterate that I agree. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to recap it really. Um, I do want to point out, though, that according to the definition of a neighborhood service district, it should be compatible with the residential character of the area. It shouldn't add to traffic congestion. It shouldn't cause noise or dust or odors or fire hazards um, or lighting objectionable to surrounding residents. And it shouldn't visually detract from the appearance of the neighborhood. And I think another fellow mentioned that just after you turn onto our road, there is actually a residence directly across the way from the parcel in question. And there are three homes up on Atherton Way that overlook the parcel directly. And I think that they would all be very con affected in those ways by any development in that area. And um, I think that all of us who live there would find the character of our neighborhood drastically changed by this development. It's a quiet and densely forested residential area. And we live there because we value those qualities. Um, we talked with many of our neighbors in recent weeks and to make sure that they knew about this proposal and no <coughs> one liked the idea of a commercial development at the end of our road. And I don't want to speak for any of those folks, but I personally think our neighborhood is already very well serviced by the neighborhood service district at the bottom of the hill. Um, there's an Ingalls and a CVS and gas stations and a handful of restaurants. And when I drove by recently, there were also about seven vacancies. So I think that um, there are plenty of spaces for potential business owners <coughs> to provide more services to those neighborhoods. And also, um, I think that neighborhood services is kind of a misleading term here. I don't think the owner really wants to provide services to our neighborhood. And if he did, he'd know that we're not really interested. Um, I think he made some investments that maybe didn't work out like he thought, but that's not our fault and the neighborhood shouldn't be expected to help him defray those costs. Um, and to conclude, I, I, my husband and I um, took a petition around because we thought there might be some folks that wouldn't be able to make it today. And I'll give the petition to you, but I just want to summarize the results. We um, petitioned from the intersection of Cedar Mountain Road and 74A all the way up to the base of the Cheston Mountain Development at Winterview Drive. And it's um, pretty much the neighborhood that's in closest proximity to the lot in question. We spoke with most of the folks. Um, out of the 25 homes in the area, 23 are occupied. Um, four weren't home whenever we visited. We went at least three times. Um, two of the households didn't support it, but didn't want to sign because they wanted more info. And one could see both sides of the issue and was neither for nor against. So that, remain, that leaves 16 households or 22 residents right in this area who are strongly opposed to the rezoning and, um, and sign the petition, which I will leave with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Body. Any other public comment tonight? Yes, yes, ma'am, the white shirt. Sorry. 
the way it would. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Petra Essouge, and I live on Butler Mountain. I'm one of the dreaded Floridians. We have a second home in Butler Mountain Estates. I uh, live there with my sister just under half the year. We love it any time of the, any time of the year. And I thoroughly <coughs> um, oppose the proposed rezoning. Um, I agree with everything that's been said to support that opposition. And also, from my impression of Reynolds Village, there is so much space there for businesses to start up and so many businesses start up and disappear, that to me it doesn't seem the economy at this time supports another neighborhood services development. Um, I totally agree with the dangerous traffic situation with the runoff. Um, Cedar Mountain Road, whilst we're talking to the county commissioners, could really do with resurfacing and um, should really be regraded, but that's another problem. But uh, there's really no, in my mind, no viable reason for there to be more neighborhood services. So please consider our quality of life, consider the natural resource that's dwindling fast, and please oppose this rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Any other public comment? Yes, ma'am, in the purple. Anybody else besides this uh, lady? Okay. Oh, one more. Somebody over here. Okay, just come on up and have a seat in the batter's box there. Hello, um, I'm Karen Fry, and I live up off of uh, Cedar Mountain Road, and I just wanted to share my concerns. Um, wildlife corridor, <coughs> it is. Um, I've seen two bears in the past three years you know, walking on Cedar Mountain Road. Um, they probably crossed 74 and they're going north and it's an all wooded steep bank. Um, the, the road, Cedar Mountain Road, where it hits 74, it's really hard to pull out there. I've got two teenage daughters and it's scary when they go to uh, high school, Reynolds High School, they have to pull out, cross two lines of traffic there's two other lanes coming over the mountain. You really can't see them. You know, ask them to pull in the middle lane. And, you know, there's a lot of times where you think it's clear. You start to pull out, and somebody's coming, you know, 60 miles an hour over the gap there. And uh, it's dangerous. I can't imagine having more traffic at the top of that mountain pulling out. And uh, I'm concerned about that. The runoff, there's water on Cedar Mountain Road. It freezes in the wintertime. There's a lot of debris and sand that runs off the mountain there and you know they're having problems with it now every time it rains we've got water and gravel and dirt and it makes the road very dangerous and I think uh, that land is really steep again I wouldn't mind if the owner wants to build a house that's great but it's really steep land and I don't think it needs to be commercial or a multifamily dwelling so, thank you thank you Ms. Fry yes ma'am I'm Tristan St. Clair and I live on 11 Atherton Way, that nice little gravel road we've been talking about. And that's my gravel that goes down. <laughs> but um, the, there are only three of us that live on there, so there really isn't a reason to pave it. So but that's okay. I grew up on a farm. I'm good with it. I'm also a tree hugger, just so you know who I am. And um, I really am trying to think down the road for our future generations, these young couples who've spoken who are planning on having their families here, and, and I have three grown children. I was your neighbor for a while. And um, I really would like to see us do something for the future. Um, everything is not about the almighty dollar. And I, am, I, I completely am, understand where you're coming from. My family owns property up in Maryland, and we went through the same thing. We wanted to zone part of the property commercial. Lots of people in the community didn't want it that way. And I voted against it because I did not want to add to that. I wanted to be able to go home as an adult and not have commercial property there. I wanted to go home to my farm. I wanted it to be a farm. A little idealistic, but you know, I was hopeful. And you know, I can see the same thing with this. I had bears come to my back door. Yay! 
I'm not afraid. And um, deer, wild turkeys, uh, chipmunks, all kinds of birds. And what I did in Maryland was voted against my own inheritance because I decided the money was not as important to me as making a future for the land and future generations. And I just think it takes more than just thinking now in this little box <coughs> of the money-making scheme. And if we can just think about the future in our children. Thank you, Ms. Sinclair. Any other public comment tonight? If not, I'll declare the public uh, hearing closed at 5.26. Uh, uh, any comments with the commissioners? Comments or motions? I'd like to make a motion to uh, deny the request. Can I have a comment? And um, I'd like to comment as well. Okay. Let's go ahead and get, is there a second in the motion? Then I'll get comments. Second. The motion by Commissioner Frost, a second by Vice Chair Jones. Comments from commissioners? Uh, I drove out and looked at this land, and I had the pleasure of having my 11-year-old granddaughter with me, and she lives in the Little Cliffs be in... Uh, behind where the big wall is, as all, you all are familiar with. And she asked what we were doing, and I said, we're checking this out because someone wants to eventually build a lot of stuff there. And we looked at the quiet houses. She said how peaceful it was. And then as we were leaving, we took about 15 minutes to get back on 74. And I said, well, that was kind of scary, wasn't it? And she said, Grandma, this isn't going to work. And <laughs> For, for all the reasons everyone has said, this just doesn't fit. Um, fellow commissioners before me have worked very hard for steep slopes. We need to honor that, and we need to honor the community. Thank you. Commissioner Belcher? Yeah. I went out today and looked at, uh, at, at this property. I, I drove by it many times, but I really didn't know exactly where it was, and I turned on uh, Cedar Mountain Road and went up and drove around, and then I came out and went out on the road and and uh, I uh, listened to everybody and listened to the uh, concerns of um, of the seller and the property can be sold uh, the concern is rezoning it and selling it for this purpose it can be sold now as it is um, and be sold for you know residential uh, and I've been real torn with this all day because I, I believe that, that um, I'm, I'm kind of in between when it comes to a lot of things on zoning. I, I don't think you should tell anybody what they can do on their own property when it comes to their private residence, but this is being s wanting to be sold for um, to generate income for the buyer, and I'm cool with that. Uh, but the, it is a very difficult site if it was smaller and they, you were doing neighborhood services close to the road and a little farther up to make it more safer, then that might be, a, be okay. And maybe in, when the six acres was involved, it was more like that. But for this full 10-acre site, the slope is a real issue uh, there, and uh, for that reason, I'm not going to be supporting it. Yeah, Commissioner King? Um, these are always difficult decisions on re zoning. Uh, we try to take into account everyone's uh, needs, desires, and rights. Uh, but with right comes responsibility. And uh, as I sit here, I think about the Great Wall of Fairview across the road and uh, how badly that went. And I, I'm, in the absence of myself being a uh, civil engineer or geologist, uh, I can't determine uh, what the impact would be to this property uh, if you started grading on it. Uh, also, in the absence of knowing what uh, project would, they would like to put there, since I don't believe there is one, it, it gives me great pause uh, to uh, vote for this. And so, if I have to sit here and have the responsibility to make a decision on this. Uh, I'm going to err on the side of caution, and I won't be supporting this. Okay, any other comments? Yes. Mr. Fryer? I've lived in this area for 23 years. 
I pull out in that road every day. I live real close to Old Fort Road. I pull out, I make it. Yes, there's wrecks there, and there's people get killed, but there is on all roads. You know, there's a way to make it safer up there with this property owner. If they move some of the property, they can actually move this road up the hill a little bit to make it better if they can work something out with the state to, to make it work. But just saying that we cannot do something, when we got a planning board that made a decision four to one that this, that this could be that way, why do we have them, you know? Why do we have a planning board then we go against them. I've been there more than one time. I've watched the signs go up. I live there when it's a two-lane road. I watched them blow off the ro all the rock off the mountain and probably in the lady's house that, that is at the foot of the mountain there. But yes, there's been wrecks. There's a child killed and it was toward the foot of the mountain. I travel it every single day. Don't want anybody killed on any roads. When they took the asphalt up and repaved when it's regular asphalt compared to the, the asphalt that they had that the water run off, that's bad. But we've all lived through, I lived through the two lanes. It was beautiful up the mountain. The trees laid across the road, and you couldn't get across the mountain hardly, period, in the wintertime because somebody would be against a guardrail trying to get up through there. We got a five-lane road. There's ways that lights can be put in, but there's ways that the people, oh, yes, there is. There's a, they put a light there, no different than they did down at Eblin and the curve down there, and you put a flashing light when, the, when it's going to be red. That's, that's why that was put in down at the other end down there. So I'm probably going to be by myself up here, but I'm for the property rights owner. That's uh, where I'm at. As, as I said, we could have bought the property next to us. They put storage buildings. They put four apartments. There's trailers there. There's a little business out front. That little business, they sell tires. There's another one, more than one business, but you got to look at Old Fort Road. There's a stone place there uh, when you come out of it. Yes, there was a terrible bad wreck there here a while back. It's in a curve too, but there's still a business there on the corner of Old Fort Road. So telling somebody that, that this is exactly what they need to do, when we, they went before the boards, so they've paid again, and the board decided four to one that this is what should be done. I have to go along with the board, and uh, that's just the way it'll be on my end. So, thank you. Are there any other comments? The only thing I'd add to it is I've lived out there for over 30 years, and I go by there every single day, twice a day, and it is one of the most dangerous places I know of in Buncombe County. All the arguments I heard today were the same ones I heard three years ago, and they all ring true. Everyone in Fairview community has an investment in what that community looks like, and every one of them has rights. I'm going to come down that we're going to, I'm going to vote to deny this because I don't think there's any doubt. There's no way you can make it safe, and I don't know how you pull out now from Cedar Mountain and some of the other places, but I certainly don't think we're going to aggravate the situation. So I'm very much against it. I was very much against it before, and I'm even more against it this time. Any other comments? Commissioner Newman? Uh, just a clarification of the process. So, because uh, several people have said they're going to vote to deny this, a vote to deny it is to vote yes for the motion. Is that correct? A vote to deny, a yes would be a vote okay. to. The uh, motion is to deny, so we need, if you want to deny it, you need to vote yes, yes for the motion. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion to deny, which will mean we do not grant the variance that's requested by Mr. Rosenberger, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. No. The motion to deny is, uh, is passed. There will not be this development by a six to one vote uh, friar against. Thank you. And if people want to leave, we'll take a maybe a 15 second break and you can, the folks that came here for this, We've got some more business, but we'll take just maybe 10 seconds to let you get up and leave. Thank you. Thank you. So ETJ's next. Thanks for clarifying that. Well, I just, I, I just, get, I get confused. <laughs> I heard everyone saying this. Like, oh, yeah. I get confused on that. <laughs> what happened? No, I don't want to.
Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the ETJ. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We'll make this part of the record. Thank you. Madam Clerk, make that part of the record. Uh, Debbie Trumpy, let's talk about the ETJ. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, um, Asheville's ETJ authority was removed by SL 2013 30. Hey, was you'll have to speak up, Dave. We can't hear I'm you. I'm sorry. Pull, pull the mic in. SL 2013 30 was ratified in April 17th of this year. That took away the city of Asheville's authority to exercise land use regulations in their extraterritorial jurisdiction, which is um, they're allowed to zone, were allowed to zone up to a mile outside their limits. Um, the bill uh, transfers authority to the county within 120 days or when the county adopts zoning, whichever comes first. Uh, that 120 days will expire on August the 15th. If we could have the presentation, please. I have some uh, maps that show the, the area that we're talking about. Um, this is a countywide map, and um, the areas that are um, being transferred are uh, outlined in red in this, uh, this map. I would like to advance the slide, please. Um, zooming in a little bit closer, the ETJ areas are in violet, and the gray areas are the corporate limits of Asheville and of Woodfin showing there. Way back. By the way. Uh, zooming in a little bit more, uh, in these maps, the current county zoning is shown, but it's grayed out a little bit. We have it there just so you can see what would abut this area, but in the brighter colors is the, the ETJ zoning. Uh, in this northeast quadrant, uh, we're looking at a little bit of area along uh, Elk Mountain Scenic Highway up in the most northern area there and then the Chuns Cove, Haw Creek, Blue Ridge Parkway area. Uh, the yellow, which is the, the predominant uh, zone, proposed zoning there, is R1, single family residential. In this southeast area, uh, this is uh, Oakley, Blue Ridge Parkway area, uh, the Ramble at Bil in Biltmore Park areas, um, Clayton Road, Ledbetter Road area. And here, uh, R1, again, is uh, shown in yellow, R2, multifamily residential, light green, R3, multifamily, is dark green. The employment districts, it's proposed, is shown in blue, commercial service in red, and public service in purple. In the southwest quadrant, uh, areas involved are uh, along Br Brevard Road, Pond Road, Sardison Road, and Sand Hill, uh, the Biltmore Lake area, Smoky Park, and Liberty Road area. And then the northwestern area, Starnes Cove, Cedar Hill, Johnson School Road, Ben Lippin, uh, North Louisiana Avenue, and Gorman, Gorman Bridge Road areas. We also, uh, in addition to the zoning districts, would be applying our zoning overlays uh, to this area. We have three um, overlay districts that would be applied, the Steep Slope High Elevation, the Protected Ridge, and Blue Ridge Parkway. In the northeastern quadrant, again, the blue is the uh, Steep Slope High Elevation overlay. Brown is the protected ridge overlay. And then uh, uh, the dark purple is the Blue Ridge Parkway overlay. Then there are some areas shown in light purple that are both the protected ridge and Blue Ridge Parkway overlays. And then in green is both the steep slope high elevation and Blue Ridge Parkway overlays. 
And then the southeast section, Blue Ridge Parkway again is dark purple. And then there's a little bit of uh, Protected Ridge and Blue Ridge Parkway that's light purple and steep slope high elevation in Blue Ridge in green. And on the western half of the ETJ area, there are no overlays. And this is um, the maps that we sh ran in our legal ads as well as uh, sent to out of county uh, landowners uh, to notify about the, the proposed zoning. Uh, the planning board uh, resolved to sponsor and initiate uh, the map amendments at their May 6th meeting. <clears throat> In drafting the maps, staff looked at the current Asheville zoning and we attempted to parallel what was the zoning that was already in place for these areas. Uh, but we did look at what was on the ground uh, in an effort to um, not create non-conforming uses. Uh, we advertised the proposed zoning and zoning hearings. We ran half-page newspaper ads, mailed notices to out-of-county um, owners, posted signs throughout the ETJ area. We had uh, 45 signs in prominent locations. Uh, we set up a web page with frequently asked questions, uh, we put the maps on our GIS, and had contact information for planning staff. The planning board held a public hearing on the proposed zoning on June 17th. Seven people spoke during public comment. Um, six of them just had questions about how their, their individual properties might be affected but did not oppose the zoning. Uh, one speaker was concerned uh, about what would happen with non-conforming uses. Um, our zoning ordinance is quite liberal as far as its approach to, to non-conforming uses. Um, they can be continued and they can be expanded. Um, and also, after adoption of the zoning, we will provide a 90-day period where owners who are in that area can come and apply for a rezoning with uh, no fee. How are they contacted, uh, the owners? The individual owners would not no. be contacted. So that they have 90 days to, uh, to make any changes. How are they contacted to know that? Just through the right now? Or no with letters, no nothing? Just no, we're right not now. sending okay. out any individual contacts, just with the information that's provided on our website and okay. the hearings. I'm sure there will be a newspaper article. Um, at the planning board's uh, public hearing, they um, found that the proposed zoning would be consistent with the land use plan as the 2006 update recommends applying detailed zoning to the area that lies within the updated Metropolitan Sewerage District boundary that is the primary surface area in the Asheville with and the area within the Asheville ETJ is within the MSD service area. The planning board found that the proposed zoning would be reasonable and in the public interest as the property is not currently zoned by Com Buncombe County and the authority to regulate development and land use has moved from the city of Asheville to Buncombe County. And the planning board recommended in a unanimous vote to adopt these maps. Do you have any questions I could address at this time? Any questions? Debbie, did you say in your presentation, or is it any some documentation, like how many parcels we're talking about? I do not remember how Your many. Ballpark it was within 100? <laughs> thousands. It's a little over 5,000 parcels. Okay. And 20 miles, isn't it, Craig? I don't recall. Uh, that's what I was heard today from Josh. All right. Uh, I, I, I would like to go back to the, the question I asked about the uh, their 90-day right to um, ask about you know their concerns on the on the zoning. Uh, I did speak to Josh today. I felt was very comfortable with the efforts that you know the fairness uh, and everything associated with this. But I would like to get a response back from staff on how they are going to contact 
how are they going to let them know that they have the the, the, the ability to to uh, appeal it or have it changed or whatever? I don't I don't expect you know to hear that because from what I've heard it's you know it's been done very well, but I would like to know how they do that, how they would be able to do that, whether we're going to we let them advertise know. It. Okay, yeah. I mean I, I, if sure. it's advertising or if it's a simple you know newspaper ad or if it's whatever we would we should do uh, I, mean, I, think I think you make a good point i mean five thousand times what's a stamp these days so i mean it's a couple thousand bucks but it probably would be just good transparent government to for pe property owners to know that there's a new sheriff in town and i mean i know that we're going to benefit mightily from new permitting so i feel like that would be revenue that would be recouped pretty quickly from from permitting so um, I mean that I, I mean I know advertising checks the box in a lot of ways but I sometimes I, I wonder if it's I like the letter yeah is it too late to um, include something with the tax bills I'm not I don't think that's a great idea if we could we can check. I think I think Gary's office was getting ready to send their stuff to the printers very very soon. So I'm he, he, be very kind tight. of sorting it. Right? If they're not able to go in there, I would since I heard some consensus from somebody on the board, I, I would recommend we send them a letter and the weeks we show the colors and you know whatever that they need to know that hey yours is yellow or yours is green and here's what it means and. You know, uh, I just think it'd be a, it, it would be uh, speak well of the of our board and staff if we could if we could be that transparent with this. I mean, I do think like the ETJ has been this. I mean, there's a lot of layers around it, but one of the things that's maddening for property owners is like who's in charge and oh, you do this and you do that. So the good news is there's going to be clarity. So let's just begin with being straightforward and just say this is who you go to from now on and. Welcome to Buncombe County. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Buncombe Yeehaw. County. Uh, we I, aim to please. I also spoke with uh, Josh O'Connor today as well in planning. And, uh, and my question and concern was that we did not in any way negatively impact the businesses that are in, in the uh, EJT. I wanted to make sure that, you know, our, our, the changeover, we were friendlier or as friendly. And uh, one in particular was one in my area is Vulcan Industries, which I was b very much concerned about that we don't negatively impact them. And uh, so uh, I was assured that, that what we're doing is in line and that if there is anything that's, uh, that would create a problem, we could rectify that as a, this board could. So that's my understanding. So can we make a recommendation to staff that they do that? Okay. Yeah, I'll How tell you what, let's go ahead and have the public hearing, then we'll do the motion, and I'll entertain an amendment to the motion if, if that's the will of the okay. board. So any other questions for Ms. Trumphy before we have public comment? All righty, well, then I have uh, 547. We'll start our public comment. We will uh, take uh, three minutes from anybody, and we, if you have any material, we'll make that part of the record. Uh, any folks want to be heard on the public hearing for the um, ETJ uh, proposed amendments? Mr. Rice, anybody else? Yes, sir. In the orange shirt, if you'll have the you'll have the first seat in the batter box. Anybody else? All right, sir. Mr. Rice, you're first, and gentlemen, in the orange shirt will be second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I'm not too good in the batter box, <laughs> but. Uh, on, the, on, on this whole zoning thing, I'd like to remind this board, there are two of you sitting up there, that was here on the original zoning on the map that got turned over uh, by sending it to the court. And it was promised at that point in time that you all would go out into the county and have meetings at each middle school and I come to the meeting after you went to the municipalities and the chairman throwed me out of the meeting because I called them a bunch of liars. I'm talking about the board members at that time. Now, I'm reminding you of that because of what Mr. Belcher is saying. You were supposed to go out and notify people. 
you didn't do it, but you throwed me out of the meeting for calling you on it. So thank you, Mr. Belcher, for uh, bringing this point up, and thank you, Ms. Jones, and thank you for supporting, giving additional information to people to make an informed decision. If you've been in the seat that I've been in, riding Buncombe County roads the thousands of miles that I do a year, and mostly in Buncombe County, Western North Carolina, the signs that they've put out is these red signs. They do not change them, and they've got a place that you write in. And somebody, I guess, goes along and wipes them off or something and puts another date in it or something because it's confusing. And it's been confusing even to me. And I've even questioned the planning board uh, and the chair about this very situation and uh, even showed them a picture of a sign where I stopped in the car and took a picture and me sitting at the stop sign and I couldn't even read it. Had to pull it up on my smartphone or get out of the car and look for it to see what the date was on it. So I think you're right in notifying the people and we did have this before where Mr. Roberts would send out notifications before. We've done this in years past on other things, not just this. So it's a great idea and thank you, Joe. And Y'all for supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Yes, sir. I'm Wayne Marshall. I live at 1 Honey Drive in Chun's Cove. My property is or was in the ETJ. I don't know. I don't know if that transfer has been finalized or not. I thought I could find Chun's Cove on a map, but the maps that were shown here, no, I have no idea where Chun's Cove is. And I do think, though, that for me to find out what is happening with ETJ, that if I have to turn on television news and find it out, is a disgrace. The city or the county one, I feel, is mandatory that you contact the taxpayers and notify us as to what is going on and have some more public hearings, maybe in a smaller grouping than we have tonight, and divide it up into districts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Any other public comment tonight on the ETJ uh, proposed maps? If not, I'll declare the public hearing closed at 551. So. Much pleasure to the board. You, so can I make a motion yes with sir. an amendment? You can. So how am I supposed, how do I need to phrase the, we, uh, the first well, part of the, uh, make a motion to support the, uh, the, uh, the the rezoning, the ETJ, and that it's in accordance with our, um, am I supposed to have that? How about a motion to amend, to uh, approve the recommended, the recommended uh, map amendments and add to that uh, an amendment to um, <coughs> notify each parcel owner either by, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I, uh, my opinion, it should be two motions, uh, however it's panned out, uh, keep the uh, motion uh, to approve or deny clean and then give direction to staff to follow up. All right, good. Okay. Very good. All right. So is there a motion to approve the recommended MAP amendments? Make a motion. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The MAP um, uh, the approval of the map amendments has been uh, approved 7-0. Is, uh, is there a motion concerning the notice to the individuals affected by this amendment? Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we instruct staff to notify each owner of the property by letter with, this, with the proper description of, of what zoning their property would be under and which properties as we say there's 5,000 properties, right, but there may not be 5,000 owners, so um, so they, they may be affected by more than one. So I'd like to make that motion. Okay, and would a friendly amendment be that it could be by the tax or a, a separate mailing, or do you want just one mailing? S send a mail or send a card be I'd probably more reasonable than a letter. I would say a separate mailing. I mean, if, if it can be. Yeah. Okay. Can, you, can you tie it into the tax bill? Can you get in time? I mean, if you can do that, that's fine. As okay. long as they get the le as long as they get a letter, I don't get whatever in the yeah. Let's just say that you leave it up to the discretion. But every 
parcel owner gets a notification within the 90 days that they have a no fee time. Is that fair to say? Yes, but let's say that they need to be notified within 30 days okay. from today. All right. Is that okay? So the motion is a, to to notify each parcel owner within 30 days of their right to exercise a 90-day period to um, have a rezoning and no fees within 30 days of today. Okay. Uh, question: Do we need to separately vote to? approve the fee waiver within the 90-day period as well? Does no, staff that, are recommending that we have a fee waiver within the 90 days? Do we need to vote on that? I that think that's included with what we're doing now. I mean, that's the recommended recommendation to uh, this board from the staff. Okay, so we recommend It's not part of the ordinance. Okay, so we recommended, we, rec we agreed that last vote. Yes. Okay, as long as everybody's clear on that, I think that's That important. was in the last vote, we did that. Yes. Okay. okay. So I want, right. be, I want to be clear on the, on the 30 days. We've given them 30 days from today. We're giving staff 30 days to contact them by mail. If and then the 90 one days runs after the 31st day, is that what? I mean, that gives them 60 days after that. I guess I, as I a point of clarification, if the motion is to give staff 30 days to give notice to all owners that you have 90 days from the date of the notice to have that appeal, then so I, I think, think you should make that as a motion to clarify it all. Okay. So that basically pushes it 120 days out, yes. right? Okay. appeals. That yes. gives everybody maximum time. Is that agreeable, <coughs> Ms. Newman, Ms. Friendly Amendment? Sure. Or is it a clarifying amendment? Okay. Does everybody know where we're at? Okay. Any other and, discussion? And, I mean, I would, and I would use that opportunity if there were some other important nuggets to include for in kind of just informing the, the property owner of, you know, who the contact person is. So this is an important issue, but there's probably a handful of other nuggets that we can, we can include to just introduce them to. Buncombe County Planning Department. So. In terms of who to contact for ordinance enforcement and other related issues, not just right. how your property is going to be recommended right. for zoning. Right. right. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a great opportunity to to reach out to them. It really okay. Is. Thank you. Excellent. Any other discussion of the amendment as vetted out? All those in favor of the amendment proposed by Commissioner Belcher and seconded by Commissioner Newman say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion is adopted 7-0. Uh, Chairman, can I ask one quick yes, question just about um, so implementation? Are, are, we, are we needing to um, increase staff for, or we've got a plan to utilize the current staff for the increased demand, or yeah, what's the plan? I think uh, in talking to the city, I think right now that we can okay. handle that. Okay. So uh, that's, that's, that's the plan. The plan. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions or any other comments? If not, we'll go on to our next item, a resolution approving Inca Intermediate School site purchase price. And I'd also, I thought I saw Chairman Reinhardt of School Board, Dr. Chairman, Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin. and Dr. Baldwin there. So y'all, who's going to, I guess Dr. Baldwin and Tim uh, will do this one. Chairman Reinhardt, I know I'm here to talk about the intermediate school property, but I've got to take 30 seconds and say thank you on behalf of our school system. First off, we're always appreciative of our local appropriations for our uh, school operations, but I want to specifically thank our county manager and you, the commissioners, because what you uh, allowed us to do, you gave us flexibility to redirect some of those funds. I think everyone's aware that our greatest hit from the state budget came upon our teacher assistance. That was about $2 million. Because we were able to redirect some of those funds locally, it significantly um, reduced the impact, especially on our kindergarten through third grade assistance. And you, you've heard me say this, uh, beat this drum for five years now. We believe strongly in that foundation of K-3, the importance of teachers and the support staff, and if you look at the legislation that came out, our General Assembly believed in that too. So thank you for that allowance. Um, you may recall for the past three years, uh, you have requested um, what I'm going to term as a long-range planning uh, document. 
uh, over a 10-year span from Buncombe County Schools, and it was our best um, crystal ball effort at identifying large projects that we had uh, that we anticipated over that span. Um, and, and all three of those years, year, um, uh, three years where that was submitted, years one through five included the purchase of property for an Inca Intermediate School. Um, and let me strongly emphasize that the property has to come first. We have to have the property before the building. Um, years six through 10 on all three of those plans included the building of that Inca Intermediate School. And along with that particular long range plan, on all the items included, we looked very carefully at our budget we looked at our sales tax availability, uh, uh, specifically from our Article 39. And so we are here tonight to ask your approval to allow us to use um, a current a portion of current undesignated uh, 39 sales tax, fu sales tax funds for the property purchase. Um, there is no question that uh, uh, this school will be needed. Um, I can give you the ADM at Inca Middle School last year was 1,057. Just to give you a comparison, the next largest middle school last year was um, an enrollment of 828. Uh, some of you may uh, actually uh, recall that uh, this middle school used to be, uh, was actually opened in 1955 as Inca High School. Um, so there is certainly a need, and I think you've heard a couple of uh, uh, Inca residents that have referenced crowdedness in the elementary school, and particularly two, uh, that is Pisgah Elementary and Candler Elementary, and in both of those cases we are projecting. We always do these projections, by the way, five-year projections for our board every spring, and um, both of those are projected to um, <coughs> exceed what we consider to be functional capacity. And certainly 1,057 students in that middle school environment exceeds what we consider to be uh, functional capacity. So with that, um, I want to turn this over to Mr. Tim Fairley, who is our facilities director. I also want to add, I've asked him to emphasize Anytime we look at any type of property purchase, I can assure you that we do a very comprehensive and thorough environmental study. And that has been done in this case. Um, but I'm going to ask Mr. Fairley, as, as the director of, of, uh, of this project, to, uh, to share some, uh, some specific details. But again, thank you for the flexibility, especially from our teacher assistants. So I have with me the uh, due diligence studies that we conducted over the last six weeks. They're posted on the uh, Board of Ed site if you want to dig into them. They're uh, easy reading at night. <laughs> as you can Good for insomnia maybe. But they, we did uh, <laughs> assemble a, a, a very uh, excellent team, a traffic engineering firm, very experienced in schools. Uh, a geotech firm, again, uh, with excellent credentials and has worked for the Board of Ed in the past and performed well. Uh, we hired an appraiser to appraise the property and uh, an environmental assessment. And we, uh, we conducted uh, interviews. We put an RFQ out, conducted interviews, and hired who we thought were the best, most qualified folks. And I think they, they came through in uh, a five-week period and did really excellent work. We also hired a civil engineer to help me interpret some of these results and to uh, put a uh, kind of a napkin sketch study together of all the parts and pieces that it takes for a school to operate, the building, the parking lots, the playing fields. Uh, and our, our team of experts here analyzed those, uh, those studies that we did, tweaked them, and we've come out with a, a kind of a schematic design that may or may not be what would ultimately be built. Um, we have prototype schools that we just built, intermediate schools in the um, uh, Kuntz and Evelyn in the Irwin and the Robertson District, and 
and, and we use that as ba the basic footprint of, of what we need because that seems to have worked very well. Folks like them, and uh, it would promote equity. So we do have um, uh, a, a game plan. I can report to you that of all the reports uh, in here, um, <laughs> all the entities uh, feel that this is an excellent site. Uh, we looked at uh, numerous sites uh, before we arrived at this site at the former BASF plant. And uh, we did that three years ago as well when we were considering a ANCA intermediate school. And at that time, we also came upon this site as the, the, the best site. Uh, things have changed in, in a couple of years. Prices have gone up a bit. Um, the economy is rebounding, but other pieces of property came onto the market that just weren't there. So we had uh, the opportunity to look at other properties. And in my opinion, and my recommendation to the board is that this is the most suitable property for an intermediate school. Um, I see we've got a uh, PowerPoint up there, and I hope I can operate the, uh, the mm -hmm. remote to uh, kind of give you a little feel for the, uh, for the site. Just a couple of slides here, and we'll kind of zoom in as we go. But that red star is the site we're looking at. It's at the intersection of Sand Hill and Sardis Roads. Uh, very visible, very centrally located and easy to get to in the, uh, in the Anka District. And that's very important because every kid in the Anka District would have to go through this school like a high school we can't right. place it out in the corner or the perimeter or an inaccessible place because it really it truly does serve the entire district so let me see if i probably had it upside down there we go so we're zooming in on it and you can see the yellow lines highlight the extents of the property you can see is there a pointer on this yeah okay but it doesn't show up on the tv um, I hope you can see the intersection of Sand Hill running to kind of the, the lower right and, and uh, Sardis Roads that, uh, that connects the, to the Anka District. Uh, we found some rock on the property. It's in that, uh, that corner outlined in kind of a light blue there. Um, it is not extensive and with the game plan we had, uh, I've asked our engineers to say, hey, if that rock wasn't there, how much more, how much is this gonna cost us because of this rock. And it ends up being about $25,000. Really not a whole lot of money. Uh, we wouldn't put the building right there. Uh, we would kind of work around that. We did find some construction debris from the building and the, the widening of Sardis Road there. And that's outlined in the red. And then here's the survey. And all those red dots you see are where we did soil borings. Uh, we looked at the character of the soil. We also took uh, water samples in numerous sites there to test the groundwater. Uh, and there was no detect of, of uh, volatile organic compounds or what you might expect. We also tested the, uh, the Hominy Creek as it enters the property in the upper part of that slide and as it exits the property in the right side of, the, of that slide. And again, no detect of any uh, any concerns there. Uh, the property was primarily wooded for most of the, the last 30 years, but about 10 years ago when this owner bought the <coughs> property, they did uh, take trees out and use some of the soil to fill other sites on that property to make it developable. So, uh, so there are some concerns and my recommendation is to the board is that uh, this owner stabilized the site, make sure that it's, it's grass covered and, and will not erode, uh, and also remove that debris. But with just those two qualifications, uh, my recommendation to the board, to the superintendent, will be that this is uh, an excellent site for an intermediate school. Any questions for Mr. Um, Fairley? Thank you. How, how close is this to Sardis Road? Okay. Pardon me? How close is it to Sardis Road? Uh, it, there, it doesn't quite border on it, but it's within a couple of hundred feet of Sardis. Oh, uh, we're talking it's on the, Sand Pepsi, Hill. The, coke, the coke plant and stuff down in that area? or The, 
that I believe oh, that's is, on Sand Hill. Is on yeah, Sand Hill down the road. This is right at the the corner where the two roads come together, but the property doesn't quite border on it. It borders on uh, the Sand Hill side of it where Hominy Creek is, and then it borders on a private road, Jacob Home Way, that uh, cuts through that Anka BASF plant. Yeah, one of the one of the great things about <coughs> this, this one of the great things about this property too is that once uh, a bridge comes across from 1923 and connects for industrial and retail or whatever else will go on over there that that will also be a, a way to connect to that school and he and it'll leave the traffic even more so it's just an amazing location there's also a proposed greenway uh, that will connect to the property that will be accessible to the school and uh, wrap all the way around uh, and be an excellent uh, resource for the for the school when was the property located how long ago by located could you well, clarify? What, how long have you been thinking about this land well we looked about three years ago the board said let's let's look at this and uh, I, I did I did a property search uh, had a real estate entity involved and searched myself and uh, found numerous properties came upon this property but because of the economy and a number of other things, the board uh, shelved the, the search. So reinvigorated that search about two months ago or so and uh, found new properties available. Some of the same properties were out there and identified this property last month as the, as the one that, uh, that we should probably look at and do these due diligence studies. So no, nothing's been precipitous about this is my point. It's been, I mean, before that three-year search, the Anka uh, Intermediate School was discussed maybe five years ago and, and put as kind of number three, the two other schools were built, but the commitment was that when uh, population growth um, proved out that uh, the Anka Intermediate would be the next in, in line. That's great, thank you. Any other questions? I think I do this every time Dr. Baldwin comes and we get a report from Chairman Reinhardt or Dr. Baldwin. I really appreciate your, your plan. You're very methodical about how you decide on schools. You look at all the factors. You have a, a wonderful checklist and, and priority about how, what weight you give mm -hmm. the need for schools. And I've always been real impressed with that, and I think I do bring it up about every time. But thank you for doing that because it, it takes a lot of the uh, subjectivity out of it mm -hmm. because if you've got the numbers, you've got all the different criteria met, then it's a real easy decision. The question is the funding, and that's our part of the process. But I, I just want to commend both of you for following that. And I've watched it a long time, and I, I appreciate it every time because a lot of agencies don't do that. So uh, that's my two cents this time. Thank you. Any other comments? or? Okay. Uh, is yeah, there a motion? I, yeah, I've got some. I want to make a couple of comments. I want to thank uh, uh, membership of, of the school board and uh, Mr. Farrell and Dr. Baldwin and, and others. My, David King and I had an opportunity to go and visit the middle school. And just for, for the record, both of my children went to the middle school. And I'm very familiar with the traffic on Asbury Road. Uh, I did see the reports. I personally was convinced uh, that um, the plan to put a uh, uh, sixth grade academy on the back of that would be nothing more than a $9 million modular. It would not be the ultimate fix. Certainly you can push things out, but it's time for Inca Candler. Uh, to have a school like this. It's an amazing location. I mean, you could not have, uh, you couldn't have prayed down a better spot as far as I'm concerned. I, I do understand the concerns about BASF and things, and, and I'm confident that, uh, I'll tell you how confident I am and that, you, that the proper due diligence has been done and will be done is my grandson's going to that school. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's got me charged up too. Uh, but I, I'm excited about it. It's a great location, uh, uh, and uh, I look forward to supporting this. And uh, 
we don't want to forget that somebody's going to explain Article 39 that we're actually, this money's not coming from our general fund, it's actually coming from Article 39 money. But what a, what a for me, a historic day for me to be able to participate in, in this, and I'm honored in the professionalism of the way it was handled, the thoroughness that it, that it is handled now, and the, the continued thoroughness, and I hope uh, the, uh, that it will be uh, carried out expeditiously because my grandson's seven, so. Uh. <laughs> Uh, do the math. <laughs> I would also uh, like to comment earlier in the evening the assertion was made that uh, this was a top-down decision and that we would rubber stamp this. Well, I'd like to refute that statement. I'd like to say that members of the community, uh, Michelle Pace Wood, Lynn Miller, the Suttons, uh, have contacted us. I have uh, bothered Chairman uh, Reinhardt, many, many days on the phone. This board has been actively engaged in this process. Uh, we have known from the beginning, uh, as this board, what's going on. And I'd like to assert that we all met in the middle, the community, uh, this board, and the school board. Thank you. And also the property owners moved on, moved on the price. And you don't see that a lot. And so that was great. Save, saved us a quarter million dollars on the property. The paper says it's two million. It's not two million. It's one point nine eight, which is less. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? I just I, it's I, I agree. It is a great location for a, a new public school. So it's a really exciting project, and it's great to see this step being taken forward. It is a it's going to be a great asset for this whole part of the community for years to come. So it's it's very exciting to see them forward. Yeah, hey, uh, before we do the motion, why don't we, uh, Dr. Vaughn, could you talk a little bit about Chapter 39 and how that works? Uh, some of the folks in the audience and possibly the public don't really understand that um, and, and how this is going to be financed. There are certainly better individuals to talk about the history, and I think to do it, do it um, justice that, that we would need to talk about the history. So I'll do my best. Okay, maybe uh, Ms. Clark there can help, but I think she was prompted to do that Donna earlier, would so certainly I forgot be, about that. Much, much better. So you can tag team with me. <laughs> uh, I can tell you from the standpoint of superintendent of Buncombe County Schools, Article 39 is a, is a specific sales tax dedicated to Buncombe County. Uh, Asheville City also uh, receives per ADM a portion of that. What is just ADM is average daily? Average daily, I'm sorry, average daily membership. Think in terms of the number of students uh, in, in each system. But it is unique. It is unique in this state. I can find only one school system that I believe has had something similar to this. This goes back years and years ago when Buncombe County was identified nationally as what they call, I've heard this over and over, the story of the dirty dozen. Nationally, we were identified as having some of the worst um, school buildings in the country. As a result, uh, uh, community members, uh, politicians, local politicians, um, I, I, I would be amiss if I didn't identify one as Senator Mar Martin Nesbitt, key players here in Buncombe County um, decided it was time to do something about that. And as a result, they worked through the General Assembly um, and, and, and therefore Article 39, which we, we call Article 39, became a sales tax specific to Buncombe County and it was uh, clearly restricted to capital school building use. Um, and as I say, that has, in my opinion, that has allowed Buncombe County Schools to be second to none in the state of North Carolina relative to our facilities. Uh, there was reference earlier about uh, legislation, uh, again, and I want to thank our local legislators, that now has given us local flexibility to use a portion of sales tax to technology. Um, well, I want to invite you all to Thursday's board meeting, but here's what I do need to, to tell you is different. Initially, that the bill that came through the House identified Article 39 funds, which again, as I said, was restricted to capital use, to give us flexibility for those undesignated funds to be used for technology. Uh, in the process of it becoming a, in the final budget, that shifted to lottery funds. Um, again, we're very fortunate in that we have undesignated lottery funds. 
Part of that is now de designated to our STEM high school. There is a portion remaining that we are now, because of this new legislation, we are going to be able to dedicate $5 million over the next two years for technology, for digital learning, infrastructure, potential digital devices, and our technology director is just uh, biting at the bits to be in front of the board on Thursday to talk about what tentatively that might look like. But that's flexibility that came out of lottery. We would have not had that flexibility with lottery funds had it not been for having this unique sales tax in Article 39. So I've probably uh, done a terrible job of, of giving you the perspective, but uh, from my standpoint, I know it's a very, very good thing for Buncombe County Schools. Donna, anything you would add or? <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Any other discussion of the um, intermediate school uh, proposal to buy this site we have heard about? Okay, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. Been a motion by Commissioner Frost, a second by Commissioner King. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion passes to buy the Inca property 7 0. Thank you. And again, we'll, if anyone, we're going to continue on, but if anyone needs to leave, we will certainly give you that opportunity. Next up, we have um, the ordinance creating the Buncombe County Cultural and Recreation Authority. Dr. Green. Okay. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I feel like every time I've stood here for the last two months, I've talked about House Bill 418 and the Culture and Recreation Authority. So, and at our last meeting, you did authorize the Culture and Recreation Authority. And tonight, we're bringing you the ordinance that creates the authority. Some of the highlights in the ordinance uh, are at about the Culture and Recreation Authority is that it creates a new government it's a, with a seven member board. Do want to tell you that we have already combined library, recreations, and culture into one department, which was just a good business model and it also facilitates the transition <coughs> as, as we move forward. The offices for this, uh, the new administration is located on the upper level of PAC Library. We're able to re uh, repurpose some space there, so they've all moved. Um, Ed Sherry, who's the library director, is managing the transition and working very closely with Brand Thigpen, who's our Parks, Greenways, and Recreation director. And they're both working closely with staff and with their boards as we prepare for the transition and, and gather all the questions that need to be answered. I do want to emphasize that these programs and these expenditures have for a long time been part of, of county budget. These are not new expenditures that we're, we're creating a, a new tax to cover. These have long, for a very long time, been part of county government. Uh, however, moving forward, we will manage them a different way under this new unit of government. The, um, the, the county commissioners will be creating the Culture and Recreation Authority. So there'll always be a tie between the two boards. However, moving forward, there has to be an arm's length agreement and relationship between the two boards, which I think will be one of our bigger challenges to lay out which board is doing, uh, has what responsibilities going forward. Um, there are some administrative timing issues that we need to work with as we move forward. We, we have to have the CRA board set up. It has to have a meeting. And we can, whatever the number, the first number of appointees are, as long as there's a majority of them there, we have to select a chairman. To, in order to sign the documents that have to go to the State Department of Revenue for retirement and um, 401k, other benefits that would be eligible to a government employee, we have to have those signed and in the Department of Revenue's hands. Once those are approved by the Department of Revenue, we can actually stand the organization up on the first day of the following quarter. So there's some real serious timing issues as we move forward here. 
Uh, so when you do approve the ordinance, I will ask you that you go ahead and appoint whatever members you're going to appoint who will be commissioners, and it does require at least one commissioner to be on this board. And then uh, I think it's prudent to advertise for the remaining positions. Miss um, Thigpen has worked really closely with the Par Parks, Greenways and, well, Greenways and Recreation Board uh, to make sure that they're informed. And as Ed Sherry has worked with the Library Board, we want to make sure that they know everything we know and that they're, they're preparing and helping us prepare for the transition. We've wanted their feedback. They've been good to give us their feedback and share the worries that, that you might have amongst staff or, or uh, the board either one. We are asking you with this ordinance to transfer the Parks, Greenways, and Recreation Board. It's an advisory board to transfer that to the Culture and Recreation Board. That's a fairly easy transition. Uh, it keeps us, the members intact and it just changes which board they're ad advising. And since this commissioner, this commission will not have a responsibility for libraries and um, recreation directly, they need to be advising the Culture and Recreation Authority. The library board is just a little bit different animal, and it's a statutory board. And but we still have the need for the advice on library operations to it, it needs to be directed to the library, uh, the culture and recreation board. So we're asking you to. And I'd like to suggest an amendment on section 10 of the ordinance that you have in front of you, um, so that we can address the transfer of these two boards. Um, if you look at the end of the first sentence, when it says. Uh, um, the, the committees are hereby disbanded. I'd like to add, and the rep respective members of these boards are transferred to the authority board as, an, as advisory committees. The disbanding language is to clarify the relationship between the library board and the board of county commissioners, and then the transferring it is to say to the culture and recreation authority, we want you to have these advisory boards. They've they spent a lot of time with us. They've done a lot of things for the county. They've been great counsel to us, developed a lot of plans, whether it's a, the sports park master plan, the Lake Julia master plan, the Greenways uh, master plan. They've spent a lot of time and have a lot of history. That will be very valuable to the CRA. Um, and I, I know how grateful each of you are to not just the existing board members, but the ones that have gone before them because they've laid a great foundation to move us forward with the, with the Recreation Authority. Um, there is a lot of work that has to be done, and we want that work to be done in a way that's not disruptive to, to our citizens, so we don't want patrons to be, use our service and feel any sense of disruption or change. They, they should not feel, uh, see a difference in terms of how it's run and the services that are provided. We want to be very uh, open and, and honest with our patrons as they come through, make sure they know what's happening uh, and who, who's responsible. This commission will still have to set the tax rate to fund the Culture and Recreation Authority. Today we set tax rates to fund uh, city school supplemental tax, fire districts. Both of those were established by, by voters. This authority is being established by the commission. It's a, it's a little bit different uh, in, in its origin. So we want to make sure people really do understand how that's uh, how we're co constructing it, what it will do, and as we can grow the information, we, uh, Kathy is setting up a, a link on the, on the website, and we are putting some information in the tax bill so we can take people to that, uh, to that site, and we want to keep it as current as we can. So depending on what we do tonight, we're able then to tomorrow add to that and, and give them a better status. So tonight, what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm uh, making the request that you create the Culture and Recreation Authority with this ordinance. And if you do create it, I will ask that you go ahead and appoint um, the commission or commissioners uh, that are going to be on the Culture and Recreation Authority. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. It, it, it's a tedious piece of legislation in a lot of ways, and the ordinance is just a reflection of, of the requirements in the in the bill itself. Okay, I've got a question, uh, Wanda. What there's there's some tight timelines you've discussed here. Yes, there are. Um, how will the employees for the library and recreation departments, even if they're merged now, will they just be until we set all this up? Will they just be paid? as county employees? Actually, our expectation and what we're planning to make this a smooth transition is that, that they continue to be part of the county until the, the Culture and Recreation Board is up and running, and we anticipate it might be as uh, 
the earliest you'll really make the transition with employees is July 1st of next year. We want to give them options and, and we want them to feel comfortable about their, uh, their employment and their security. <clears throat> well, I think, I think that's a very, very important part of this board's concern is that each employee of the CRA gets the same benefits, the same salary. It's not a job cutting or a job uh, demotion. It is the same or more is what I'd like to see it. And I think this board has expressed strong opinion that nobody has a cut in any benefits. If anything, we, we do more. But we definitely, do, this is not a demotion. This is, this is just a different entity that nobody in the state has ever done is what, what we hear. This is an entirely separate unit of government. We've heard that, um, that feedback and as we prepare and bring policies to both the Culture and Recreation Board and then as they'll have to be approved by the commissioners, we, we are following that guidance. Okay. So, so my questions have to do, I guess, around both the, um, okay, first let's just talk about the initial board. Yes, ma'am. So, and I hear that we need an official board so we can sign the document so we can get rolling and there's, there's, <coughs> there's time lights to meet. So I guess my question is, and so I w want to hold in balance the fact that because this is a new board, a very important, making a lot of important decisions, I, I do want us to kind of announce it to the community, you know, receive applications, us do our due diligence to select those people. But I, I hear some of this urgency to get some of the, the mechanics done. So is there a way to kind of have uh, a, a partial board started mm -hmm. that we could, we, and we could, do that, i.e., yeah. the, the, I know there's several folks on this board that have expressed interest, so we could kind of start with like a founding board and then as quick, as qu not as quickly as possible, but with, with all deliberate speed f of intentionality that we bring the other people on, uh, but we are able to really. The way it reads is um, it can take action with the majority of the of the members who are appointed and I do think it's prudent to advertise for the positions that are not filled by commissioners but I think there's going to be a lot of interest in the community so if we had initially four board members from the go ahead with your question I'm uh, so if we if we uh, this is just an idea it might not work according or, or we might have to modify it based on this idea but if we started with four appointees from this board that would be the majority that would be a majority that, that would be, be a, well that'd be a majority of this board too so it, how we have to notice I, I, I think it is a problem uh, to have a majority of this board be, be the majority of, of that board in terms of how you notice and who's really making the decisions. It's not this clear that it's a public board anyway. We, I mean, we would notice it regardless. We would, so. but we also have to notice that the, the majority of the Board of Commissioners are in session in addition to the Culture and Recreation Authority being in mm -hmm. session. So, but if we have to have a majority of the board appointed for it to begin operating? No, we just ha have to have um, however many you appoint. We just need a majority of those appointees oh. to be able to meet. So if we appointed three. Three, three, they could meet and they could take some initial actions on we things could. that need to be right. done. Oh, okay. With respect to everybody. And we can do it with, with three, uh, if you'd like. That would be... Um, <coughs> We just need to have the first meeting of that board at, at whatever level you appoint it so that we can get a chairman appointed and some documents signed. We, nobody has the authority but the person who's uh, chosen as chair of the CRA. And to the, Mr. Chairman and, the, and Dr. Green, I'm reading it slightly different, but I think there's, there's, a, there's a middle way to fix it because the legislation and the ordinance both say that uh, the board, the authority board shall consist of seven members. A quorum is a majority of the board, and action by the board would take a majority of that, so three of four. If, if uh, three members of this board and pick four random people are required to have a quorum just for, the, for, for whoever an interim chairman is uh, to sign the documents necessary to get the retirement system funding in place, okay. then the ordinance also allows that uh, any member can be removed by this board at any time. So it could be an interim board in that respect but I think it would require seven appointments I have a question about housekeeping should we vote 
on the CRA first because nice. if it's not a 7 0 vote, then we, have to have we can't decide any of this right now anyway. Is that correct? That's correct. We, uh, an ordinance only passes uh, okay, first read so 7 0. So we need to figure this out, but we need to figure the other thing first. Okay, I, so I, I guess my second round of question has to do with this, um, the whole boards and commission piece. And um, so if I've understood correctly, so we've got three different alternatives here. Um, is, the, is the first one the one that's currently in the, of this, uh, the first one is currently what is published? The draft that was presented to the board says are hereby disbanded, period. That's what's in the packet material before you. Okay, so these are three new alternatives. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So what you're saying is, so we, which one did you refer to when you were making I the presentation? I referred to the second one okay. where it makes it clear that the advisory board will continue in, in a role with the, with the CRA. So the, the alternative two would mean that we would still uh, have, that, that these boards would still exist in our community to advise and serve, uh, but it would just serve a different it's body. Right. It would serve the authority and not the commissioners. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. And it would serve in an advisory capacity together. for they both. They would still be there. That would be alternative two. That's right. So. So we have to say the word disbanded, but it's really not as bad as it sounds. It's not as bad as it sounds. It's just we have to comply with the statutes and, and kind of sever the relationship between the Board of Commissioners and the Library Board. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. And, and they would function as an advisory committees. Mm -hmm. They would. Yeah, and and, and do they, do they, um, can I ask no, one Yes, ma'am. Do they, does the, does the future authority have, they will appoint them from go here forth? And they will. Okay. And I think it's critical that we have the feedback of the existing oh gosh, boards. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even a close call in my mind. And I think the other one, I think I've talked to everybody, most of you anyway, about about this. We, we've got to have their collective wisdom in what they're doing now so we could go forward with what we want to do and and have the best uh, CRA we in, in possible. So. And they have a lot of history with our departments today, so it's very helpful. And also for the continuity of the employees and their stability as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right. So, so am I correct from our, my conversation with Mr. Frew earlier that the only part of the ordinance that we are about to adopt that is different than the the state statute is this this what we're discussing right now, the current boards and commission content. Other, other than that, the, the ordinance has been developed strictly based on the, the adopted legislation. I, as we discussed, I, that, that Section 10 is the only thing that varies uh, from the legislation. I did clarify some meaning, tried to make it flow better, yes. and, and cleaned up membership just a little bit, but right. that's the only thing that's, that's the, new. That's the new thing, okay. Because there's going to be a different relationship with the library board anyway, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a new statutory addition to the what was there before. Absolutely. By, by, by us adopting this, so I yeah I think it's I, I think it's going to be different no matter what we do. Okay, is there a motion or is there any other discussion first? Then we'll ask if there's a motion to adopt. Uh, let's first take a motion to adopt the ordinance with any amendments, and then we'll talk about the membership. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, on the vote on this tonight, does it need a 7-0 vote to uh, pass where it don't have to go to the two weeks from now? Yes, sir. This is the uh, meeting at which this ordinance is first introduced, so it would require a unanimous vote to pass today. In the first in the first setting? Yes, in the first setting. Otherwise, it need to come it back has for to go, a majority come to go vote. to the next meeting. Yes. That, that's my question. And I kind of follow up on that one. If, if, um, if there is a, a second vote, on the 27th, which is our next meeting, not the 20th as we normally have. Would that make it, is there a possibility we could get started before the fourth quarter if that was the case? It'll just depend a lot on uh, whether or not the Department of Revenue gets those papers back to us approved in the month of September. We have everything ready to go. We just need a, a person who can sign the documents and we'll get them off to them right away. If they get them back to us in September, we we're good to go on October 1st. And that kind of goes to the second point, to have a signing authority to get that going, right? And with the, I think with the minority, if we appoint them tonight. Mm -hmm. Chairman, 
Sir, one more sir. question. We was talking about the salaries and different things. Uh, how did this work with the health department, Manny Jones, when you, you did that? That's, that's another area that okay. I'd like to have an understanding because we don't. And actually, I think the biggest difference there is we contracted with a, a, a nonprofit to provide a service. Here, you are actually creating a government, and I think that that's a big differentiation. And um, so we did have over 100 employees move to Minnie Jones, and we did make sure that they had retirement and benefits uh, when they moved. But on the benefits, like we're talking here, how did the benefits go with our employees? to the nonprofit of Minnie Jones? They did not retain our, ben our benefit package. They had a benefit package at Minnie Jones. But Some, it, I'm like going to make a motion, but, but I wanted to reiterate, we're keeping everything the same. I, we have heard that real loud and clear <laughs> as we prepare the documents, <laughs> yes. Good. So in terms of creating the this, um, authority um, I'd be happy to make a motion uh, to adopt the ordinance um, that is has been uh, printed with the um, alternative to to the, the language of section 10 that would read um, I probably should read this out loud because uh, it's not it's not in anybody's packet so um, in, in addition to the not in addition instead of the current section 10 that is is printed uh, it would be current boards and committees. The Board of Trustees of the Asheville Buncombe Library System established by Buncombe County Resolution Number 17075 and is amended by library, I mean, um, Buncombe County Resolution Number 17093 as well as the Parks, Greenway and Recreation Services Advisory Committee are hereby disbanded and the respective members of these boards are transferred to the Authority Board as advisory committees. It is the intent of this Board of Commissioners to relinquish any formal authority it has over these boards and leave future decisions regarding the efficacy of advisory panels regarding libraries, parks, greenways, recreation facilities, or cultural organizations to the authority board. That's a motion. I'll second it. Okay, there's been a motion by Vice Chair Jones, a second with the amended uh, provisions that uh, Vice Chair has read. Is there any discussion? If well, not, I, one thing. Yes, sir. I voted against the whole budget, and if I voted no tonight, it's going to bring it all the way up to the 27th, and I'm not going to push that issue that far. So I will be voting with you. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you. Right. I think the bottom line is it's going to make things better, and I think we just. It's going to take a lot of work, but I think we have an opportunity to do something that's groundbreaking and <clears throat> better for employees, better for our libraries, better for our parks and rec. So I likewise support it. Any other comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion as amended is adopted 7-0. My next re request would be, would you appoint from the commission the board, the members okay. that you that you will have on CRA. I'd like to make a motion that Chairman Gann is the chairman of this. Say again, please. I'd like to make a motion that Chairman Gant is also the chair of the CRA. Second. I'd be glad to serve. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. You didn't oppose no? <laughs> like, can I, as a point of order, can we do that? I'd is have the, to defer this is, this the is attorney a new on that. Government entity, isn't it their <clears throat> board's choice? As to I, I just pulled up here? the uh, session law, and uh, you're correct. The, this board cannot do that. The CRA board has to <laughs> appoint its own chair and vice chair. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I'm just trying to figure out these mechanics just for the short run. So, like, mm. what you're saying is, if we have a board, we can sign the documents and we can go, right? That's right. <clears throat> so. For just that mechanics, can't we just <coughs> appoint this entire board for a short period of time while we, and, 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 and do that business, and then we advertise to the public uh, the o other openings, and then we will knock some people off <laughs> of, of this board and then and bring others on. I mean, it's a little awkward, but if it facilitates 
yeah, the business I, getting done, is that another way to do it? Commissioner Jones, I believe you can because the session law also says nothing in this act shall prohibit the appointment of only elected officials to the authority. So it would just be the somewhat cumbersome double notice provision to have this board get together to appoint a chair and vice chair and get the document signed, but it, it's doable. But couldn't we just like the next meeting we have adjourn and then re-adjourn, re-start uh, and then approve that and then move on and it just required the notice, but yes. But, we, but we could notice it with the others meeting. Mr. Yes. Frost. Would it be more expedient if we were doing it with that thought in mind to have Dr. Green and Assistant County Manager Clayton on the board, um, and then that way we can have a more um, thoughtful process, and then that way there's more continuity, there's no double notice of... Do, do we want to set a time limit? That's the one thing of all seven of us i think that would be part of the of the motion if i mean I, I i this is okay this is holly's land but <laughs> that we do this just to get the paperwork going but we simultaneously put our put the advertisement out and, and and this board doesn't do any other business and except for get the paperwork rolling mm -hmm. sign those documents and we interview and, and and select our people and really the first time that the the board meets is the is the seven that we want to start that's when all the work happens mm -hmm. uh we don't try to start you know developing policies or even doing research we just we wait till that whole board is set that the, the, this would just be a almost a one-time thing i think you and could we do that we thing. do it i mean for that matter i mean we, <clears throat> we can do it tonight i mean we could Right? And we I don't our, know that you're noticed in, that we you're didn't in a notice. session. Yeah, there's a separate right. session requiring a, okay. the usual seven days notice to, to 48 hours for a special meeting. So it okay. had to be at least so 48 anyway, hours. But you see what my, my point is. I'm not trying to start do do business of the broader board. In fact, I think that would be kind of weird. I, 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 I wouldn't want us to do it, and I also wouldn't want to start out with staff either. I really want the community involved. But I also want to move forward with our employees being able to get their retirement. And so it's... That's, that's the thing. My, my thought in mentioning the staff is um, not the, not so much notice. Um, you know, is it a different amount of notice if it's just? No, no, it would be the same thing. If, if the CRA board were reported all seven of, them, seven of them today and wanted to have a quick meeting, we'd have to have time to have at least 48 hours notice to have a special meeting for the purpose of signing them up. If, even if that was three members of this board and okay. four members of the public, that same notice would be required. But what if there was just three? <clears throat> but you still I, have to have the I'm notice. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All so right. if, we, if we did that, if we had that meeting, uh, if we noticed it for the meeting that we're already going to have the 27th and we did that, does that get the ball rolling for what you need to do? It, it does. It's, okay. a, it's basically a, a three-week delay in signing the documents, and that's, that's the hard thing. I, I don't know if everybody's available to notice a meeting in the morning for a special call just for signatures. I, I, that's the only thing that's going to roll it fast enough for us to be sure we're able to uh, operate on October 1st. So when do you need it by the October? I was hope, I, well, we need the documents signed right away to give Department of Revenue as much time as they need so we can stay after them and get so it. So if October we were first. to notice a meeting tomorrow can we do morning? a special call meeting noticed in the morning for 48 hours? I think that hit us Monday. Friday would it make us Friday? Friday morning. It would have to be, yes, Friday. Can I, can I, ask, a, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. And, and, um, would it be, um, could I ask the other members of the commission to uh, indicate who may be interested in serving on the board on a more kind of a ongoing basis, just to kind of get a sense of like who, who would be potentially interested in that and kind of get a sense of, get a sense of that? So, I would be. Okay, Mr. Uh, Frost. Holly. Yeah, I, I have been from the beginning very vocal that I would like to be part of it. So, Vice Chair Jones and, and Chairman Gant. And gentlemen, I think I got enough on their plate. So we have four people that are interested. Um, I kind of think, I, I think I would support, um, so we can get the ball going to point us all right now and understand. I, I, I think that the way I envision this, ladies and gentlemen, is to have members of the library board, of the parks and recreation board, and some folks possibly to help us with putting this and getting the message out of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, 
and I think I think we would need to be very careful in the any other people we we appointed. It won't be the same seven that we start with if we did this. Um, I, I think that's what I would support. It's just going. Let's appoint us. Let's get the paperwork signed. We can. I would. If we we can meet, I would suggest maybe Friday afternoon if it'd be better for folks. Um, this Friday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. And we'd need a quorum. <coughs> so all we'd need is four, I guess, of of that, right? Is that yes, correct? Yes. Correct. So if folks had conflicts, we wouldn't necessarily have to. I think we'd what appoint a chair and and designate the chair to sign the paperwork to get the employee mm -hmm. uh, paperwork going, so that they could make sure they were covered. Exactly. And that's yes. the only business we need to have conducted. So it would be a short meeting. I don't think it would time. be. Um, and you're, so you're only going to have four people at that meeting. Well, we could have anybody. Yeah, but yeah. if for some reason people couldn't show if, if folks, up, we'd yeah, only need to have given the have notice. Four. Right. Yeah, if we could do maybe. But four. if you're appointing the four four commissioners, does that not constitute constitute a quorum for the seven that was going to be on there anyhow? So do well, yeah, we, we have to do a double notice, but that's that's. that's, that's but what I'm good. saying is that only those four commissioners have to be at the meeting. Right. If if, if people had conflicts. We'd notice it for both the commissioners because we have more than four commissioners, and the uh, CRA, which is a public entity, and either one would have uh, four would work. We could get we could get business done if folks, if folks had conflicts because I know it's not much notice. So I'm I'm a little bit confused. So tonight, the purpose of appointing four is so that we can have that CRA board meet. And I hear that we would appoint all seven. Yeah, I all think seven. we're going to do all four. Yeah. All yeah. seven. Yeah. We'll have one meeting as a group. And then we, we also would want to, I think, have the time for advertising. I would suggest we do that right away. Yeah. Just advertise right. for yeah. the folks that aren't going to be yeah. on this board, that are going to be on the uh, CRA, and instruct clergy. Let's get that full blast now. Sorry. And And then I think another decision we might want to talk about is whether we want to interview the folks that are not going to be commissioners before our next meeting. I just don't say we're going to have enough time to get good pool of candidates yeah, okay. to do that. Not, so not, not Friday, but the next, the 27th. Even that's only three weeks. That's only three, that's three weeks. weeks. Yeah. September. I really do think you're going yeah. to push into September. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, we get through the craziness thing that's by doing this other. First. So I think, I think you know, if we get the other group in into September, we're in good shape with other stuff. That's true. The big, the de the time, the timeliness is to get the signatures. That's right. The retirement Once we system. do that, we can appoint the other. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. Okay. And if we could, if we do this, if we do this uh, <clears throat> approach, I think it, I think this makes sense. But just making sure we're not doing anything inconsistent with what we just voted on, the um, <laughs> because the 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 ordinance does talk about specific lengths of terms and things like that so in a way we're kind of doing something a little different here and that this is kind of an interim process and then we're going to appoint these folks who actually will have serve out these three you know these these different lengths of terms is, am i am i under am i thinking about that right it, it is something is of that, a mixed bag but yes the uh th there's specific three-year terms but we included language that uh if i can find it oh i'm looking at the uh, something different but there is a language that in terms of membership that uh, members can be removed at any time by this board of commissioners and reappointed no no reason is needed to be given so it's on C. that basis i'm thinking it's oh. interim and it gets changed it's, for, it's 4c any member of the authority board may be removed by the board of the commissioners by a majority vote a quorum being present no cause for removal shall be required okay so it sounds like we can do it right although obviously that kind of sounds there, there's an, but an, the understanding that this is <laughs> There's another yeah, thing. Really, an interim board for this purpose. I There's think. another thing in this. Mr. Fryer, this won't be used on campaign Mr. materials <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Mr. Fry, Mr. Gantz, the chairman, and we're looking for four. So let's take one from the three districts. If it's Joe or District Three, Ellen, I'm fine with you taking it from District Two. Uh, let's have three districts and the one chairman, four, right now, and see what happens. That's the way I look at it, because. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with Ellen taking it, and I think you're fine with Joe taking it, aren't you, David? I mean, I, I mean, I think we're talking about like in the future, and I tend to, I, I tend to agree that it, noticing is not going to be a big deal. I mean, it's just so if, if four, if four members of this board are really interested in it, 
I, I don't see any I mean I, I'm trying to figure out what the problem is if we notice if we've got to notice one we can notice the other one so I, I would say I, I would still I think I'd go with seven and then that'll give us the maximum flexibility oh no no at the people. beginning but I'm, I mean but but going forward in terms of just to kind of yeah start with seven start with seven uh, start with seven maybe I could ask is there a way that we could say we'll appoint the seven as an interim board until October 31st or something so that there's not the question about coming back and quote removing anyone I, th I think we I don't I don't know that we state that as an absolute but that this is with the intent that uh, at least uh, three members of the initial board uh, shall resign or be reappointed by that date but there's nothing I mean because there is the legislative authorization I want to make sure we're not voting for something that is inconsistent with the enabling legislation because if the enabling legislation does sort of set forth these specific terms mm -hmm. and then we kind of vote for something that's different terms then I just don't want there to ever, whatever this board well, votes to, to create I don't want there tonight, to be a legal like question mark about three the validity of it three two two one 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 but, but, uh, I mean can we, would that would that be consistent with the legislation if we in addition to pointing to seven of us we also assign terms to us all I think so my only worry is um, that we're leaving I'm still in favor of three commissioners and four people that, from the community because we need that input we need that expertise as I see it we need strong leadership from libraries greenways parks and I think um, by talking about terms and I'm more in favor of you know once we get the paperwork done then go go about hearing from the people in the community that want to be on it and then as Browning said they get kicked off the island <laughs> rather than saying terms right now the, the terms do seem contrary to what well there, there's there's always the other way to look at it uh, I think that th there could always be a gentleman's agreement that three or more members of this board appointed to the original CRA board will will agree to resign and then then you know what else what choice do you have but to appoint someone new and then this board wouldn't be taking action that may be viewed as contrary to the uh, legislation I, I'm fine with that too and that, but I, I really agree with what Ellen said I mean I'm happy that there's four people who want to serve on it but I think what is the right number of elected officials versus community members is a really good question um, whether we want it to be a majority of, of elected officials versus community I think is something we should give some thought to so I'm happy to move down the path of having this meeting everyone's on there as long as we don't close the doors on kind of having continued discussion about right. the right mix going forward once we have time to really give some more discussion to, the, to that question nobody could ever say we don't discuss <laughs> and, you know my original thought on this too was that if it was <coughs> going to be seven I was hoping it would be a few more but but uh, this was only going to be seven that it, would probably not be in the best interest of the CRA the community to have four seating commissioners on that board mm -hmm. that you'd want the majority to appear to come from the uh, the community and still have the the stability of the three commissioners that would would serve so well I, I, I tend to agree let me just ask this legally can we appoint on an interim basis and not get in terms or would you recommend that we do terms because I we can go ahead and do it either way I think the only way uh, to be bulletproof right off the bat is to do what Holly suggested and point yes one year one year two year two year three 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 um, but uh, that's not what it's again I mean I don't I don't think that I wouldn't recommend saying that it's going to be an interim board because the legislation doesn't okay. specifically provide for an interim board okay I'd make a motion that uh, we appoint Commissioner Frost, Commissioner Belcher, and Commissioner Gant to three-year terms. We can appoint uh, Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Newman to a two-year term, and Commissioner Bel uh, beginning 14, and Commissioner Fryer and Commissioner King to a two-year term beginning. Oh, it says beginning though. So that's a problem. That's when the, the terms run. We we that was tough language. Yeah, for that, all that, of that was through. hard language to 
to swallow as well. But if we, we're counting everything from July 1st, 2013. Okay. And then okay. we're saying when the terms start thereafter. That 2014 language in there says from that date, from 2014, that those seats run for three years. Okay, okay. Then I would make a motion that we appoint Melcher, Gant, and Frost to um, three-year terms, and Newman, Jones, uh, King, and Fryer to two-year terms. Second. As, well, on this well, board. Two of them have to be one year terms. Okay, I'm I have sorry. a couple of one years. Okay, um, you, uh, Friar and, and uh, King one year terms in. Second. Okay. I know this is not the way we, <laughs> we definitely discuss this when it's an odd, unique situation. Is there any discussion? I think that's, I guess just need to get just it going. Did. Okay, any other discussion? Your meeting will be Friday afternoon. Let's shoot for, for that first thing in the morning. Yeah, how about Friday at one? Is that four of us can attend, say, or two? Um, three. Two. Uh, three. Oh, I'd rather get it. I don't want the whole after. I'm fine. Whatever y'all want to do. Yeah, I'm it okay. I guess it doesn't matter. I was hoping to. Can we go 12? Up early for once. No, I've got a. No. Oh, I, I've got a meeting at noon downstairs. 11. 11. Eight, what about 30? 8.30. Hey, early 8 school. 8.30. 8.30. Is 8.30 a.m. good for Winter. four commissioners? 8.30. Does that work for you, Dave? Sorry. David, It'd be a you short meeting. You That's okay. going to be quick. You got something scheduled? All right. And then our first meeting will be 8.30 Friday for the Madam Clerk can. Yes. Okay. Got it. And, since that's and then we'll continue call, to have extensive discussions about the composition. We'll also in yeah. instruct the clerk to immediately get the advertising uh, for an unspecified number we haven't really resolved that tonight unspecified number of spots on the commission and we will be uh, we will as uh, commissioner newman said a gentleman's agreement to and this there is will be some with that 48 be hours it's a special call so we have to just lay the topic out and okay okay and the agenda for friday would be nom elected chairman and i guess that's only the order and of authorize uh, him so to execute authorized documents, documents. Yeah. Right. that would be it Okay. And then right. we meet Did here. We do that? Yeah. All right. Any other discussion? Then we took the vote. Okay. Let's do it. That's Thank great. you. What else we got? Uh, the last uh, item on our uh, agenda is board. Let's know we've got the waste. We've got two two matters from consent. Um, waste. Hey, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman Gann. One of our, did we did we vote? Didn't go a motion okay. and a second, but I don't think we voted. Motion and second, my okay. mistake. All those in favor of appointing those individuals as designated, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. We will we will move forward. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, thank no, you. Thank that's you. that's a pretty good question. <laughs> Resolution uh, regarding the authorization of agreement between Buncombe and C D M Smith for organic waste processing feasibility study. Mr. Creighton. And I appreciate it, if, it, as if Ms. Ball does not sit through enough meetings with City Council. Thank you for sending one of our longer ones. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, I want to talk to you tonight about, as you mentioned, the feasibility study to do a, a, a processing, organic waste processing facility. <coughs> kind of give you a little bit of background. Uh, a couple of months ago, Kathy Ball, who's assistant city manager, called me and basically wanted to talk about a partnership in doing a study both the city and the county working together to look at the feasibility of, of dealing with organic waste, mostly of it coming from uh, city residents and also uh, a brush. The purpose of the study is to go through and to look at collection methods. Obviously, uh, do you modify vehicles or is it a separate collection? Containers. Once the material is picked up, how is it transferred and the processing facility itself? Is the county interested in that or is it a private individual that does that? To kind of look at those different options. One of the main things is that we've got to look at is to see what the percentage of that organic material is in the waste stream. So that's going to actually take physically going through uh, a selection of trucks and just to see what, what is comprised there. But overall, we're going to look at the cost of collection, uh, the cost of impact to the city on doing it, uh, the cost of impact on the county. 
both uh, percentage waste lost if if that material is taken out and goes someplace else what what effect does that have on the tipping fee and also what's the impact if if we are a partner in this and we do a, a facility how does that impact uh, our tipping fees and also do we look at having a separate tipping fee for organic waste and uh, I guess last and most importantly is is once a finished product, what do you do with it? What, what market is out there? Is there a, a revenue stream for that or is it just, just a market that people will take it? So that's what we, what we want to look at in the study. Uh, as of just a side note, I was looking in the U.S. Today last Thursday and there was an article in there saying that there's 180 entities in the United States that are doing organic composting now. New York City's looking at it. Uh, San Francisco's been doing it for quite some time. So it's kind of that new th trend out there to say, okay, here's a stream that is going into the landfill that's being married. Is there something we can do, you know, do with it? So I'd like to ask Kathy just come up and say a few words as far as from the city side of it. And then if you've got any questions, we'd be more than happy to, to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bond. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Ms. Vice Chairman, and members of the board, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, we, we're excited. The city has taken an initiative on to try to reduce the material that we take to the landfill and have been very successful in the recycling program. The material that we've been able to, to divert from the landfill has been large in volume, but not necessarily in weight. So our next step is to, was to explore and look at the ability to do residential composting. And in order to do that, we, we um, have a couple of challenges with that. One of them is where to take it and then what to do with it afterwards. Uh, we approached the county and said, we would love the opportunity to be able to look at your facility so that even if we're not taking it and putting it in the landfill, maybe we're running it across the scales and putting it in some kind of a composting facility at the landfill site. Um, and that would benefit both the city and the county so that revenues wouldn't be lost from the county in tipping fees. So when we approached um, John and had the discussion, we saw it as an opportunity for both of us to have success. So we've worked to this point to, to bring you this agreement that the city would pay half the cost, county half the cost, and then we would be able to come together and see how this could possibly work together. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to come here. Um, I have enjoyed uh, and continue to enjoy a great working relationship with Buncombe County. Thank you. Let me end up by saying that the, the feasibility study cost is $99,200. And like I say, that will be split both between the city and the county. Okay, any questions? And on our side, it would come from our enterprise fund? Uh, yeah, it, professional services. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is that 99,000 split between the city and the county? Yes, sir. Only thing we can do to deal with our waste, and we always want to partner when it's a good cause. So it sounds like a wonderful program. Any other discussion, comments? Any motion? Make a motion to approve. Motion. Second. Motion by Commissioner Newman, second by Commissioner Frost. Any other discussion? All those in favor of approving the resolution say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion is approved 7 0. School Capital Commission Fund Project Ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Ball. I'm sorry that we didn't. She, she sits through enough meetings. I'm sorry you had to sit uh, a little bit longer on this one. Thank you. Thanks for your good work with the city. I'm sorry, did you need me to explain something? Uh, if you just just tell us what this, I think uh, we wanted to hear what the ordinance is and what uh, what it means to us. Okay, we explained that earlier. That's the Article 39 that will pay for the land purchase. Turn your yeah. mic on. Correct. It's on. Sorry. It's the next item. Yes, it's the next, it's right above grant project ordinance, the School Capital Commission Fund project ordinance. And I think it was connected with the Article 39. Hey, are there any other questions about Article 39? In Buckham County, there are four articles of tax. Uh, the Article 39 is the one cent tax that, that is paid. Half of that that's generated in Buckham County goes to the School Capital Commission Fund and funds uh, school capital projects. 
and that's the fund that will be used to pay for this land purchase. And this is just the paperwork to verify what we've just done in, with the income intermediate school That's correct. site purchase. Mm -hmm. So we're just doing the paperwork now. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Commissioner second. Belcher. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, the one we just did. Yes. Uh, second by Commissioner King. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The motion is approved 7 0. Hey, um, I have a question just from a kind of yes, sir. A, a process standpoint. So, this was the budget, basically the budget amendment to execute this. This was so this was on the consent agenda, and I appreciate it being pulled. I learned a little bit just about the different pools of funding and how they work together. But um, had this not been pulled from the consent agenda, in the unlikely event that we had approved the consent agenda, but then not voted to approve the land purchase option, I don't know. I guess I guess my question is: when we have a budget amendment that's directly linked to an agenda on the item, shouldn't they be, I don't know, voted on to sh kind of together? Usually, usually it is a like a bullet underneath. It. I mean, it's another line underneath it. Usually, that's why. It usually I is, and we will was certainly make sure. Was wondering why it was in the consent. So. Okay, yes. great. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. Uh, board <coughs> appointments: Asheville Buncombe Regional Sports Commission. We have one appointment. Any nominations? I'd like to nominate John Craig. Are there any other nominations? Not all those in favor of appointing Mr. Creighton say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Mr. Creighton is appointed 7-0. Thank you for one more <laughs> task for us. Uh, Crime Stoppers Board of Directors, there's one vacancy. Is there a nomination? I'd like to nominate Andrea Block. Andre, Ms. Block has been nominated. Any other nominations? All those in favor of Ms. Block being appointed to Crime Stoppers in the one vacancy, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Ms. Block is so appointed. Announcements. Uh, well, do we need a closed session tonight? Yes. Um, four matters tonight. Uh, closed session, General Statute 143-318-11A, under subsection 3, uh, regards a current lawsuit, uh, Buncombe County CVS 12-5118, that's Town of Black Mountain in Buncombe County versus Lexon Insurance Company and Bond Safe Card Insurance Company. That's a uh, uh, defaulted subdivision, the settings where they are, the homeowners through the town are suing to try to get infrastructure money for the failed subdivision uh, infrastructure. Uh, the second item under subsection three is Hannah versus Buncombe County. That's an industrial, uh, that's a workers' comp matter, uh, X63456 and file X70617. Uh, also under sub section four we have an economic development matter to discuss on a possible renegotiation of an economic development agreement and uh, under subsection six a personnel matter uh, regarding the personnel matter i don't know whether there'll be any action coming out of closed session or not all right thank you we'll ask for a motion after i read the announcements the next meeting of the board will be august 27th this is a change from our regularly scheduled meeting due to several commissioners and the county manager being out of town that, that meeting will begin at 4.30. Commission meetings can be seen on BC TV Charter Cable Channel 2, ATT UVerse Channel 99, live on BuncombeCounty.org during the meetings, or online anytime at BuncombeCounty.org. Is there a motion to go into closed sessions for the reasons stated by the county attorney? So moved. Been a motion by Commissioner King. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Fryer. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 We will be in closed session. All righty.
say from here, but is that that building right there the, the current building or is that building not? Yeah, that's the building now. That building. The bank is there now and it's uh it's first building. Right there? That's, that's 20 years ago, right there. Yeah. It's 20 years, and then it's. No, uh, it's further down. It's probably, yeah. It's more than that. 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 Yeah, but it'd be past the corner house. Yeah, that's what it would be. But yeah. if you have to go get it at Christopher, it wouldn't be. Right.
Good night. Up in the meeting, yeah. Get it out of here. <laughs> Better not. <laughs> I think he's coming. I'm hungry. It is uh, eight twenty-two. We're back in. Is there a motion to go back into open session? No. Motion by Commissioner Frost. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Jones. Is there any discussion? Uh, we will not be taking any action on any of the items we discussed in closed session. Um, and so, is there a motion to adjourn? To move. Motion by Commissioner Belcher. Second by Commissioner Jones. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. We are adjourned till August 27. Thank you, I'm sorry we kept you so long. Thank, Thank you guys. You.